Hello, good morning everyone here in the audience and uh, online. Uh, we will now start this session on uh, plant health in an era of global change. Um, I present my start by presenting myself. I will be one of the chairs of this session. Uh, I'm Ana Cristina Cardoso and I work at the European Commission Joint Research Centre located in the northern of Italy. Uh, where I've been working since uh, the last uh, 27 years. And uh, in the last 10, uh, I'm responsible for activities related to uh, research and science for policy uh, support in relation to implementation of uh, alien species policies, in the context of which I'm responsible for the European Alien Species Information Network. Thank you very much, Anna. So welcome, everyone. My, my name is Claude Bragard. I'm professor at the UC Louvain in Belgium, and I'm also the chair of the Plant Health Panel at, at EFSA, European Food Safety Authority. So welcome, everybody. And we are on the way just to start this session. Hope it will be interesting. OK. <laughs> so you are probably all aware of uh, global trade, movement of goods around the world, and, uh, of course, Plant commodities are also moving. And what is really striking, if you look at this, is that if you are, for example, a plant commodity coming from country A, suddenly it's changed and it is coming from country B. And uh, we are also importing into the EU new goods, new plant uh, commodities, and this is really coming up like this, surprisingly. But with the goods, with the plant commodities, plant pests are also moving. We have insects, mites, nematodes, fungi, bacteria viruses coming into the territory. How do we deal with this pest able to produce epidemics? Maybe you are aware or you have heard about Xylella fastidiosa, this bacteria affecting olive in southern Puglia in Italy. But this bacteria has been found now in Tuscany, southern France, Corsica, it is present in the Balearic Islands, mainland Spain, Portugal. How do we deal with these challenges? And are we able to predict the risk incoming pests? Is it possible to anticipate? How do we prepare ourselves to tackle these challenges? These are questions we will try to handle today. Uh, of, of course, with our keynote speakers, and thanks to them for participating to this session. But a very important point also is that you have to be part of this session. So please you're, use the app uh, with this uh, conference. Huh? So you, you may interact with us, provide us with comments. You may start already. Ask questions. You may like also questions to, to tell us, well, this is very an important point. So be, please be part of this session by actively uh, uh, participating uh, to this. And so I will start directly inviting Ellen Roy, uh, from the United Kingdom Center for Ecology and Hydrology. And the floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you Ellen. Well, good morning, everyone. And it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. And I want to first begin by thanking EFSA and um, for inviting me here um, to be with you and to give this presentation. So thank you very much. So I'm going to talk about predicting the future risks of biological invasions to plant health. And the work that I'm going to describe is incredibly co collaborative, and there should be many, many more people listed on this title slide um, than just me, but there are too many names to mention, but I will try and mention some of them um, as we go through. is not moving forward just at the moment. Ah, there we are. So here are some of the people that I've had the pleasure of working with um, through global collaborations on biological invasions, and the insights that they provide through these collaborations are just so important. And I think that's a message I've been hearing throughout this conference is around connections and collaborations and communication, and how important that is for us to address these big issues. So I think we're all aware now that biodiversity is declining faster than at any time in human history. 
And we know from the IPBES Global Assessment that was published in 2019 that there's a really stark figure around the number of anticipated extinctions, um, and that's just one measure of the biodiversity change, of course, that we are seeing. And then there have been other reports, such as the State of Nature within the UK, that resonate exactly those findings. It's a bleak state for biodiversity. We know very well now what is causing biodiversity change. We know about the major drivers of land and sea use change, direct exploitation, of course, climate change, pollution, and biological invasions, invasive alien species. We also know it's much more complex, and there are many indirect drivers interacting with those direct drivers and underpinning them, whether they be demographic or economic, technological, etc. And I'm really proud and privileged to be part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services thematic assessment on invasive alien species and their control. I'm one of the three co-chairs, and maybe some of you have provided um, reviews through the process when the um, assessment has gone out for external review. Um, the assessment will be reporting next April, and it's been just such a, a great privilege to work with the authorship team of more than 80 from all around the world. And I'm very excited that we will be publishing um, that next year. And it really recognizes the huge role of biological invasions within this whole story of global change. So just to be really clear, in the terminology when we're thinking about non-native or alien species, and I know within the literature there can be quite a number of slight nuances around um, the terminologies that are used. But when I'm talking about an alien species, it's a species that's been moved by, from one part of the world to another part of the world. And very importantly, it's about the human activity. And we heard just then about the trade, for example, or the movement of plants. The ways in which we are moving things around the world at this unprecedented rate is also, of course, moving some of the species around the world that have some unintended consequences. And I have quite a passion for ladybirds. And um, this is a ladybird that was first reported in the UK in the mid-1990s. It is an alien species. It was introduced um, unintentionally by humans. But you can see, perhaps, from that map that it's got a really um, limited distribution. It hasn't spread very far at all over the few decades that it's been residing within the UK. So we think of it as just being an alien species. It's actually, for someone like me, it's a real pleasure to go and see it. It, it feeds on white bryony. It's a very specialist um, ladybird. In contrast, we can see this is the harlequin ladybird, Harmonia axoridis, and this is a species that's native to Asia. It was introduced as a biological control agent to many places um, around the world. And um, first introduced into America in about 1916, and there was no evidence that it was spreading from its release sites and actually was a very effective um, aphid control agent. But unfortunately, in the 1980s, it became apparent that it was beginning to spread from those sites within um, America. And by this time, it had been introduced to many other places around the world. And you can see on this map of the UK, it first arrived in 2004 in the UK. It spread at about 80 to 100 kilometers per year. And we know that because we launched the Citizen Science Project and gathered lots and lots of information on um, the movement of Harmonia axoridis. It's a large ladybird. It's a generous ladybird. It doesn't just feed on pest aphids. It will also feed on a whole variety of other insects. And indeed, it will also feed on soft fruits and can be a little bit of a human nuisance because it aggregates in very large numbers during the wintertime. So it is an alien species because it was introduced by humans, but we would term it an invasive alien species because it poses a threat to biodiversity, ecosystems, and indeed the way we live. So when we think about plant health and the impacts of biological invasions, there are many different species from many different taxa that we can think about. And we heard about um, the xylella already, for instance, the pathogens and the diseases. But we can also think about other things, such as um, if there are um, invasive alien species that have an impact on pollinators, for instance, then we can expect to see some um, issues for plant health. And Vespa velatina, for instance, the Asian hornet or the yellow-legged hornet, is a species that arrived in France and is now spreading into a variety of other places. And it is um, 
a voracious predator and feeds on honeybees. It really enjoys feeding on honeybees, but it will also feed on other pollinating insects as well. And then we can think of a whole variety of other species um, that are invasive alien species that pose um, some kind of problem for plant health, whether they be the herbivores or a natural enemy, such as Harmonia axovitis, which was introduced to have plant health benefits, but actually can also have these unintended consequences. So one of the um, projects that I've been involved with for a long time back in the UK is documenting biological invasions. And um, we have a database with all of the non-native species um, listed within it and lots of information about those non-native species. And we know that we have more than 2,000 established non-native species within the UK. So these are species that have self-sustaining um, populations. They're reproducing within the UK. We know that our database is really dominated by plants, but um, when we look at those species that have some kind of impact, we know that it's the animals that are really causing a lot of problems. So more than a third of the animals that have been introduced have some kind of impact, some kind of adverse impact, whereas about 6-7% of the plants do. And it's really lovely to see Anna Christina again and to think of the wonderful work of the AZIN network and the information that's um, gathered through um, AZIN for the whole of the EU. One of the things that we do with the data that we gather um, within the UK and indeed many other countries do the same thing around the world is to look at the trends in invasive non-native species over time and you'll see I'm switching between non-native and alien and I apologize for that but in the UK we use non-native and I know the rest of Europe use alien and I tend to be in this hybrid format of switching between the two but it's the same term non-native or alien species. And every year we produce um, an indicator for our government department to show the status um, and trends of non-native species, of invasive non-native species, particularly within the freshwater and marine and also the terrestrial environment. And what we can see is the numbers are going up year on year. And when we look at the species that are included within that indicator, because we only use a subset of that 2,000 species, that are the ones that are considered to have some kind of impact. We can see that there are a number of herbivorous insects with included within that biodiversity indicator, which obviously have um, potential plant health um, implications. And these are some of the species that are included within our biodiversity indicator. For example, um, the oak processionary moth, but others as well that you'll recognize there. And we can see that over time, just on that indicator, but if we go further back, we can see that this trend of increase is really quite um, dramatic. And I just think it's quite interesting to sort of plot some of these first records of species that have arrived um, over time and to see some of the newer arrivals that um, are coming. And we have recorded Vespa velatina within um, the UK since 2016, but because we have um, involved beekeepers and other citizens in surveillance, we've been very successful in um, eradication programs for um, Vespa velatina, so it is currently absent um, from the UK. So one of the things that we've also been doing, because it's all very well documenting all of these alien species, documenting the problem and seeing the problem increasing over time, but if we want to do something about it, we need to make some predictions about what might be the next species that could arrive and how could we prevent their arrival because that's the most effective thing that we can do. For example, with the Harlequin ladybird, once it had arrived within the UK, for instance, people were asking, so what are you going to do about it? And we knew there was nothing we could do about it. And you could see from that spread map with a, uh, an insect spreading at 80 to 100 kilometers per year and with a really high... Um, reproductive um, potential, it was really, really impossible. So prevention is really, really important. And um, so one of the things that we've been trying to do is make predictions about what could be the next species that could arrive in a region and how might they arrive and what could we do to prevent their arrival in the first place. And so we've been using a horizon scanning approach, using a very systematic and structured way to assess thousands and thousands of species that have some kind of invasion history around the world and see whether they could potentially arrive and establish in a new region. 
And we use a process of expert elicitation, recognizing that there are huge gaps in our knowledge. So we gather the best available information that we have, working with large teams of experts. And then we pull all that information um, together. And then we all talk about what, we've, what we have um, listed to come up with a ranked list. And we did this first of all in the UK, but then also we had the great privilege of having a European Commission funded project um, to carry this exercise out for the whole um, of the EU. And although it sounds maybe like we do a lot of just talking about things, we do use some quite um, rigorous criteria, such as the um, IUCN, ICAT um, categories, the Environmental Impact Classification for Alien Taxa. And we carried this out in Britain um, back in 2013, but then we repeated it in 2019. I will say that quite a lot of our top 10 um, species did arrive in that time. I never know whether that's a success or failure. It's kind of, we made a good prediction, but um, it was unfortunate that they then still arrived. We still keep, when we repeated the horizon scanning exercise, we still have Vespa velatina as a very high up species. But what I've put in bold here within this top 15 species that we listed are some of the other species that we're really concerned about could have a problem in terms of plant health um, particularly. And things like um, the emerald ash borer is of course a huge concern to many of us across um, the EU. <clears throat> but we also, if we look at the longer list going towards the, the, the species that we rank between 16 and 30 in our, in our list, we can also see that there are a number of um, other species that we are concerned could arrive um, within Britain and um, pose a risk to plant health. For example, the brown marmorated stink bug, also the citrus longhorn beetle, for example, and uh, another, pine possession, another possessionary moth here, the pine possessionary moth. So when we were um, having carried out this exercise in Britain and then being funded by the European Commission to carry this out for across the EU and working in partnership with many amazing um, people across Europe. Um, we also then published um, the list that we produced um, through that activity. And this is the publication there. And you can see some of the, the lead authors listed there. And we looked across freshwater and also marine and um, terrestrial species. What we then did from that process is we also had some European Commission funding to come up with some minimum standards for a risk assessment process. And we were able to draw on the really wonderful work of EPO, for instance, and also the GB risk assessment um, to be able to look at the EU regulation, which had really excitedly come out in um, 2015, and see the criteria that were in that regulation to see how a risk assessment could be made to match that. And so we linked these exercises, the horizon scanning and the um, minimum standards of risk assessment um, to be able to take the next steps in terms of that prioritization of species. And so the invasive alien um, species of union concern, in part, the horizon scanning has fed into that process to prioritize some of the species for risk assessment that then appear within that list. We've also then used this horizon scanning approach um, around the world. So the UK has 14 overseas territories, which many of which are islands with really unique fauna and flora and simply amazing and inspiring people with incredible expertise. So we've worked with them collaboratively to get priority lists for all of these islands. And on many of these islands, plant health is a really key issue because the plants and the crops that they are growing on these islands, they're really reliant on them in terms of them being their immediate fresh fruit and vegetables, for instance. So that connection to the plant health um, is really, really evident within particularly some of these remote locations, such as St. Helena, for instance. And this is St. Helena, and um, we had the pleasure of visiting a number of these places to carry out the horizon scanning. And what you can see here is an amazing and beautiful island. It has more than 400 endemic invertebrates, species found nowhere else in the world. But what you can see through their cloud forest is this New Zealand flax, this really spiky plant that's formed a monoculture um, throughout. And so you really evidence the problems firsthand of a biological invasion. So carrying out this horizon scanning for all of the overseas territories, we can see that there are some species in the middle here, um, 21 occurrences, where they have human health impacts, they have economic impacts, and they have biodiversity impacts. So many of these species, it's not just that they may be having an impact in biodiversity, but also they will be having an impact on plant health, and indeed, in many cases, um, impacts across all of these categories. 
So these are some of the species that we have pulled out when we do this kind of global horizon scanning. And we see things like the giant African land snail is particularly problematic and reaches really high numbers on some of the territories, particularly, for example, in the Caribbean islands, and poses a really direct problem um, to plant health there. But then we also see species such as the little fire ant, Wasmania or punctata, which... Um, when it invades an area, it renders the agricultural land impossible to use. The workers can't use it because it's such an unpleasant species to be alongside. So this horizon scanning has um, been useful for informing policy and action. So as I already mentioned, within the context of the EU, it's been one of the tools for informing the list of invasive alien species of union concern alongside these rigorous risk assessments, which Wolf Wolfgang Rabic is leading the team for from the um, Environment Agency in Austria. But also in some cases, it's about implementing action immediately and enhancing biosecurity. And here it is in St. Helena, the people, the biosecurity team who were amazing. We got stranded over there. The airplane couldn't land and collect us. And so we had an extra week. So I said, is there anything we can do that's helpful? And they invited us to join the biosecurity team, sorting through all the fruit and vegetables and looking for the plant pests um, that might be coming in. And they're just amazing people with amazing expertise. We, we learned a huge amount. But as we've heard throughout this conference, one of the many things that's really important and perhaps one of the most important aspects is around communication, increasing understanding of invasive alien species pathways, raising awareness of the threat and the problem of biological invasions, and highlighting pe to people the simple actions they can take in the way of, for example, biosecurity, checking their luggage before they go somewhere, checking their shoes and making sure they're clean so they're not being part of the problem and transferring species around the world. And again, I have a great privilege of leading a project for the European Commission at the moment um, on understanding of invasive alien species, and we're developing communication campaigns in collaboration with stakeholders um, in a variety of different sectors. And I'm delighted that later this year, the um, communication resources will be published um, through ASIN. So just to finish, and I only have 40 seconds just to, to wrap up with this, there are some areas where we're really neglecting on making our predictions. We really struggle with microbes and diseases, and we need to do more, and we need to get better at that. And of course, we know with things like ash dieback and now with Xyella, we know that there are these species on the horizon, and we need to be better at predicting them and doing something before they arrive, rather once they're here and they're causing a problem. And it's important that we take this holistic, this, as we're hearing throughout this conference, this one health, this one society, this one environment, that we work holistically, that we think about the landscapes, we think about the species, we think about their interactions. We embrace this complexity and we communicate about it to make sure that we really make the best informed decisions going forward to address these major environmental issues that we're facing. Engaging people is absolutely critical, and we've seen that through the horizon scanning. We could not make these predictions if we didn't have this diverse group of experts and stakeholders involved, and it gives that opportunity to really communicate about the issues directly while working on something so important as making predictions about the next species that could cause a problem. And we've published a paper around um, using social influence and expert elicitation to guide conservation decision-making. And citizen science is, of course, really important as well. And we've been working through a cost action, Alien Citizen Science Investigates, to explore a whole variety of citizen science approaches. And we've seen it really effective in the UK for Vespa valentina, as I already mentioned. And we've seen the success in terms of eradication of that species. And we know, had we not done that eradication, this is what the spread map would have looked like. This is the extent of where the Asian hornet would have been from our modeling um, within um, Britain had that eradication not taken place. So just to summarize, we know that biological invasions are impacting across all sectors. And we know that it's important to make predictions to inform action and particularly pathway management. Collaborations and partnerships are absolutely critical and making sure that we embrace the complexity and that we communicate and raise awareness but also I think there's a real joy in us all coming together and sharing our experiences and learning from one another and really trying to make a difference in terms of one health, one society and one environment. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Helen, for setting up the scene. Uh, really, it was a very interesting talk. And thank you for driving also our attention to the environment and the biodiversity, which is also a key issue. So, 
We have time for questions, but this will be uh, taken on board just by the end of the three speech we have this morning, uh, during the session. And so I let you have your seats. And the next uh, speaker will be Anna Berlin. Anna Berlin is from the Swedish University of Agricultural Science. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, session and talk and uh, about something that I really enjoy working with, uh, but maybe it's not so good for the world. Uh, and for you who is online, I put a picture of myself just to so you see who is talking. Uh, yes, so the title of my talk is uh, Fungal Plant Diseases and Food Security in this Serial Rust pers Perspective. So who are the cereal rusts? See if I can change. So you know the cereals. We have uh, rye, wheat, barley, oat, and triticale, and uh, they all get infected by uh, cereal rust. And the one that is most uh, uh, promiscuous uh, uh, is the stem rust, and that can infect all of the different uh, species. Then we have the yellow rust, which uh, different versions infects uh, rye, wheat, and barley. We have leaf rust, which is actually two species, but they are in, one infecting rye and one infecting wheat. We have the barley leaf rust, which is, of course, infecting barley. And we have the uh, oat crown rust, uh, which infects uh, oat. And, uh, and so this, uh, it's a big diversity, but <clears throat> in this talk, I will focus on two of them, the stem rust and the yellow rust. Uh, so why should we care about these rusts? They are historically important uh, uh, pathogens, and they have been and they are wind dispersed. And uh, as you can see on the map here, the red lines are historical uh, uh, dispersion dispersal patterns of uh, different uh, rusts. So the one going from uh, West Africa to Australia is the uh, yellow. Uh, yellow or stri stri stripe rust um, in, uh, in the late 1980s. Uh, so you can see that they are transported uh, very long distances, but they could also be transported by us humans when they are uh, like stuck on, uh, on our clothes. I have a very, I, I, commu I communicate a lot with the uh, local advisors in Sweden and, and they were talking about why, why do I see rust? In, in, I only see it in the field where I enter the field. And that's because they <laughs> the, the advisor was actually transporting the disease between the fields. So it's not so, you have to take care of how you behave. Uh, so, uh, so what harm does it uh, do? We have a very healthy wheat plant here. Uh, and the stem rust, it infects um, no, I probably clicked too many times. It, it fact, it, as, it, as the name says, it's in fact a stem. Oops, yeah. Uh, so, and, and, the, and the other rust, they infect the leaves. And when the rust infects the plant, it will, uh, uh, it will not be poisonous or giving mycotoxins like many other pathogens, but it will limit the uh, the grain fill, so the harvest from an infected uh, field will be very, very much lower, and the, the seeds will be crumbled. And there are, of course, a lot of conventional um, management methods. The most commonly used are resistant, um, resistant cultivars, pesticide application, and removal of the alternate host. Uh, and and. Uh, but that's, of course, not the whole solution. Uh, so uh, this uh, slide is just to inform you about the different terminology that is used in cereal rust. So we are working with biotrophic fungi. That means that they need a living host to infect. Uh, and they are, can be divided into different uh, categories based on, uh, based on which host it, uh, they infect. And that is called forma specialis. They can also be, you can also have heard about cereal rust races, and that is basically uh, a phenotype determined by the gene for gene resistance in cereal hosts. And on the, the picture shows these different reactions 
uh, in, that determines the phenotype. But of course, with the development, with the method, we also have use a lot of molecular tools, and we can also genotype by different methods, uh, and then we talk about clonal lineages. So I will use this terminology, that's why I try to explain it. Uh, and another thing that is important in the cereal rust is the life uh, cycle, and this is similar for the yellow rust and the stem rust. So they both uh, have a grass host, which is wheat, for example, or it can be oat or barley. And, uh, uh, and that is uh, A, B, and C uh, in this picture. And it's this uh, A, where you see the stripes and the small, two small round spores. That is the clonal stage of the pathogen, and that's also where you have this um, uh, a massive amount of spore production that can be that cause problem. But you also have a second part of the, of the life cycle, which is on, the, on, on this side. And that is the, on the A-shell host, or the alternate host. And for stem rust uh, and yellow rust, that's barberry. And that's where the sexual cycle of the, of the, of the, of the life cycle is completed. I push uh, forward, but it's not... Uh, uh, in the same space, speed as me. Okay, so this uh, Asial, this uh, Asial cups, they actually create a lot of variation. And this is an uh, experiment we did where we took, uh, took picked uh, individual horns and genotyped. And as you can see on the on the right side, uh, within the the within one cluster of Asial horns, they share one allele, whereas the other one is, can differ, which means that if only a one successful completion of the sexual uh, reproduction creates a lot of variation in, in this um, pathogen. And this is true for both, uh, for all of the rusts. Uh, so what role does this barberry have in Europe? In the uh, UK, uh, they have started to replant the barberry due to the barberry moth. And uh, that creates, of course, a lot of diversity in the, in the rust population. Uh, and uh, in Spain, uh, which is the two photographs, uh, they also they have two uh, uh, different uh, barberry species, which, actually, with, which play an active role in the stem rust epidemiology. And as you can see in the picture, it's very difficult to spot these bushes. They are present almost all over. And it's the same in Sweden, where the law of barbarian eradication was withdrawn in '94. Uh, and uh, we didn't have in Sweden we didn't have the stem rust in wheat until 19, uh, 2017. And the picture shows the extremely heavily infected uh, wheat in Sweden. Everything that you see is that is black is actually stem rust. Mm. Okay, so if we look at the barberry distribution across Sweden, uh, th this is a, a map uh, taken from the um, Species Diversity Center, and the barberry distribution clearly overlaps with um, uh, agricultural areas in Sweden where you grow crop. So this is, barberry is a very important um, in the epidemiology of stem rust in Sweden. And I put some of the species here, and the one in red are the ones that are resistant to stem rust. So they will not be part of the part of the uh, of the life cycle. Uh, so the current status of uh, stem rust in Sweden, uh, we have higher diversity uh, where barberry is present. And that is illustrated by the gray fields in the different circles. And as you can see, we have a lot of gray in, in Sweden and Norway because it's, it's wind dispersed, and also in Spain. And in the rest of in the other countries, it's less diversity. Uh, and th there has been a shift towards uh, more virulent lineages, uh, and this is very, uh, really a worrisome development. 
and recently it was it came a publication that really states that the stem rust is re-established in Europe. And we look at the <clears throat> diversity in the presence and absence of uh, uh, barberry. This is a very big table, so I will help you. This on top is the the samples in the in the presence of barberry, and in the bottom in the absence. And as you can see in the middle, you have this uh, a lot of figures and dots. And when there is a f number, that means that it has a virulence gene that it can infect uh, that. Uh, uh, wheat cultivars with that resistance. And as you see in the bottom, the clonal lineages, they are much more specialized than the ones on top. Uh, yes, and, but the, the his history is quite different in the yellow rust. Then there, it's much lower genetic diversity. And uh, because, because we didn't know the HL host until in 19, uh, 2010. And there is only evidence of sexual reproduction in Asia. And for, stem, for yellow rust, it's more of this clonal reproduction. And as you can see on the bottom, uh, uh, this, uh, each color represents one clone. Uh, and you can see that they are replaced each, or some, they dominate for a couple of years and then they are replaced. And if you're cu curious about the current status, you can go to the Global Rust Reference Center's webpage and pick out the current status for yourself. Uh, yes. And uh, it's similar here. Uh, the uh, the gray uh, uh, fields uh, illustrate uh, the sexual reproduction or the other other lineages. And as you can see, there are a couple of, a couple of clonal lineages that dominate the, the population across the world. So if we compare stem rust and yellow rust, stem rust is frequent uh, sexual reproduction and it's very high diversity where barber is present and it's normally favored by warmer climates. Whereas yellow rust have more specialized and aggressive lineages and complemented with higher diversity in certain regions. And this is traditionally fa favored by clone, uh, colder climates. But not some of these new races are adapted to warmer climates. And this is one sign that the, stem, the rust, they can adapt to newer, newer uh, uh, conditions. Uh, there are also signs of fungicide resistance in cereal rusts. And this is, traditionally it has been thought that they were not uh, subjected to this, but this is, something that we need to take into account in the future. I push forward. Okay, but of course, we now I, I told you about the story. We have some, uh, some clonal lineages, we have some where sexual reproduction, but, um, and there are a lot of new techniques that offers new solutions and answers. So for the serial, ho serial host, there is the new techniques, they offer this um, uh, possibility to breed against the resistances. And for the pathogen, we can use diagnostic tools and monitoring uh, based on both molecular uh, tools and, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, infection uh, experiments. And this gives us uh, tools to monitor this, uh, uh, but it demands a lot of work. So will this yield gain be lost to diseases? Well, we need to keep up the surveillance and be aware of changes in the pathogen to adapt the, the cultivars that we grow. Uh, we need to use this host resistance in a wise way. In some areas, we could plant large areas with uh, uh, resistant cultivars. We can also plant uh, cultivar mixtures to limit the impact of the disease and take away the ones that are heavily infected the cultivars that become heavily infected. We can, of course, use chemi control, chemical control in, in certain places, but they need to be monitored to limit the pesticide resistance. And then we need to investigate the role of barberry. So I will end with this slide that's coming next. Uh, and this is uh, that uh, the Norma Borlaug, which is uh, uh, started, restarted this uh, uh, 
uh, research, um, he, he stated that rust never sleeps. And I think this is true not only for rust, but also for other pathogens. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Anna, for this very nice talk on uh, serial rusts and the challenging issue of this disease worldwide. So maybe before inviting uh, Prasanna, don't forget the app, don't forget to ask questions or provide us with comments. So please do it online also, you are invited to do so. The next speaker this morning is uh, Prasanna Botupali from the Global Maize Program, International Maize and Wheat Improvement Center. The floor is yours, Prasanna. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. After that very nice talk uh, by Anna on serial killers, uh, <laughs> uh, which Simit uh, is also intensively engaged in, uh, let me move on to uh, a pest, an insect pest that is causing uh, tremendous concerns across uh, Africa and Asia and has become a major threat to the maize production in several pockets across Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, as well as East Asia. Um, yeah, this is uh, something that we need to be very conscious about. Uh, climate change, uh, human factors, including globalization and trade, uh, all this has been leading to devastating epidemics over the last uh, few years, um, especially. In Africa alone, uh, there have been six devastating epidemics uh, with, uh, with huge consequences, economic, uh, social, and environmental uh, implications of this. Uh, so therefore, uh, how do we deal with these challenges, which are rapidly spreading across the globe? And this is one of the major uh, examples of such uh, devastating uh, pest incursions, uh, the fall of Iwam, uh, which was largely confined to the Americas till 2015, and the first major report of fall of Iwam, Spodoptera frugipada, uh, happened in 2016, official report uh, came up uh, through our colleagues in IATA, and within a span of uh, just two years, it has spread to over 44 countries uh, in Africa. And in 2018, uh, it first came into uh, India in a small pocket uh, called Karnataka. And then um, again, within one year, it spread to all over India. And within two years, it has reached all the way up to Australia. So this is, uh, this is perhaps one of the most rapid spreads that one can ever see in, in terms of uh, uh, an insect pest. Simit team, together with colleagues in, uh, uh, in CABI, in ECPE, uh, did a lot of work on socioeconomic impact of this pest. And uh, the spread and impact, for example, of Fala uh, has has caused billions of dollars of crop loss, especially in case of maize, uh, in countries like Ethiopia and Kenya, and in many places like Ghana, Nigeria, and so on. Uh, so for, for many of the African countries, don't forget that maize is life. Just as for Asians, rice and wheat are so important. African diets are so heavily uh, dominated by maize. And anything that happens to maize, uh, it has a huge ripples across uh, the political spectrum. Uh, so the collaboration imperative uh, is very evident. Uh, of one of my friends in USDA uh, termed this Fala Miwam as a wicked challenge. Uh, the pest knows not only no geographic boundaries, but it has multiple generations which can happen during the crop season, and, it can, uh, and it's typically very difficult to conquer. So there is no single solution that can provide sustainable control, nor there is uh, any single organization, however mighty it might be, uh, that can provide all possible solutions. So international research for de uh, development collaboration is indeed very important as country level efforts or regional level efforts or continental level efforts. Uh, that's when we started off this consortium, Fala Miwam Research for Development International Consortium in 2018 uh, after a conference at African Union Commission in Addis Ababa. And uh, 
pulled in uh, different institutions with the diverse and complementary expertise as members. Over 44 such institutions, including several from US, uh, Europe, as well as in Africa, uh, are partners in this, uh, in this consortium. Okay, uh, let me see why is it not moving. Okay, so one of the first tasks for us is to bring out some effective communication resources so that farmers, especially the smallholder farmers, uh, uh, can, can understand what this pest is, how to diagnose the pest, what to do and what not to do. Uh, uh, when the pest uh, attack happens in their fields. Uh, this is particularly important as there is a panic reaction by many farmers applying toxic pesticides. Uh, and I have seen literally uh, some of the smallholder farmers, especially women, applying cocktail of pesticide mixes with bare hands in Africa. Uh, there, is, there is nothing that is more, more dangerous than this to their health as well as to the uh, health of their children who walk in the fields. Uh, so this situation was very dire, and uh, uh, thanks to a partnership with the Michigan State University, uh, we brought out a scientific animation without border, that's called Sabo Video, uh, that explains in the local languages uh, what this pest is and how to diagnose it and what to do uh, when it happens. Again, CABI, CIMIT, and many organizations again came together and established a Fala Mivam research collaboration portal, uh, sharing information on diverse aspects of uh, integrated pest management tactics. Um, to me, again, this co-creation, validation, and deployment of eco-friendly, sustainable, and integrated pest and disease management packages, including host plant resistance, biological control, biopesticides, agroecological management approaches, against this targeted uh, pest like Fala Miwam is extremely important. Good agronomic management or good agricultural practices should be the foundation of that uh, very important pyramid. And application of pesticides should happen only when they, uh, the thresholds are, are crossed. Uh, CIMIT has particular advantage in terms of breeding for native genetic resistance to an area of challenges, abiotic and biotic stresses. We hold nearly 28,000 uh, maize germplasm accessions in our gene bank at Mexico. And uh, some of the land races are very powerful in terms of possessing traits that can help us in breeding for resistance to falamiwam and for other pests like stem borers or post-harvest insect pests. Uh, Cuban flints are particularly very well suited for that work. And so is the Mexican Taxpeno land race. Using these two land races, our colleagues in 1980s and 90s at CIMIT bred uh, multiple insect resistant tropical and multiple borer resistant populations. And using those populations, we derived inbred lines. And these inbred lines have been then introduced with multiple traits of interest to the smallholder farmers. And today we have uh, one of the best facilities to screen germplasm against Fala Miwam at a place called Kibako uh, in Kenya, which is two and a half hours drive from Nairobi. Kibako, by the way, in Swahili means hippopotamus. So <laughs> that place used to be very popular with hippos, and still there are hippos there. And there are 13 such huge screen houses, one fourth the size of an acre each, uh, that uh, enables us to routinely screen thousands of germplasm every year. And more than 10,000 diverse germplasm accessions we screened in the last few years. And this effort has led to identification of some very, uh, very strong inbred lines, which are the building blocks for hybrids or varieties. And you can see the responses of this, like CML 574 or CML 338 or CML 71, is as good as uh, you can see in transgenic resistance. Uh, this is but not controlled by a single gene or few genes. Uh, the polygenic, the resistance here by native genetic resistance is typically polygenic. And, uh, and multiple mechanisms are involved in it. Then we quickly spread these inbred lines, resistant inbred lines, to diverse institutions across the world, including Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe, Australia, 
so over, over 90 institutions coming from 34 countries have been recipients of these uh, native genetic resistant inbred lines from CIMIT maize program. And most importantly, we need to then constitute hybrids which combine drought tolerance, disease resistance, as well as falami worm resistance. And three such hybrids have been shortlisted. And then we did uh, extensive no-choice trials under artificial infestation in those screen houses. Uh, that means there is no other genotype other than that in a huge screen house. And you inoculate it twice during the crop season and see the responses. You can again see here the typical falami worm tolerant hybrids versus highly vulnerable commercial checks. Uh, seeing is believing. So come to Kibako and see these materials in our experimental trials, you, you'll be amazed about the phenotypic responses. Then it's not just foliar resistance. It's also how clean are the ears that are harvested from this under severe artificial infestation. You can see here typically the commercial checks. You can see the black marks there are nothing but ears that are eaten away by the insect. The falami worm can typically bore through the husk leaves, enter the developing ears, and eat away the kernels. And it, it provides a cascade of other pro possible problems, including mycotoxin-producing fungi. Then we licensed these hybrids to multiple partners across Africa. As many as 12 different countries are presently uh, uh, try, are under, undertaking the national performance trials. South Sudan uh, last month was the first country to release all the three hybrids. And Kenya is uh, perhaps the next one in line. So we are expecting to see at least 10 to 11 countries more to release these hybrids, native genetic resistant hybrids, uh, by quarter three or quarter four of this year. Uh, so that's about native genetic resistance. Then let's come to next slide. Okay, this is the BT maze. This is another powerful tool in the armory um, uh, in terms of falami worm control. Uh, but unfortunately, not many countries in Africa have adopted BT maize other than South Africa. Uh, BT maize is now grown very uh, well in uh, South Africa. And uh, Monate 9034 especially is, uh, is an excellent uh, event uh, to fight against the falami worm. It's a, it's a dual gene or a stacked gene, uh, which is much better than Monet 10, uh, which is a single gene event. Uh, Philippines and Vietnam also have released this event, and they are doing very well in those two countries too. Uh, and uh, recently, Bruce Tabashnik and uh, uh, some of us came together uh, to analyze what it means in terms of managing falami worm. Uh, can BT maize sustainably improve the control? What needs to be done? What cannot be done? How to have insect resistance management strategy in place? Uh, especially when we talk about BT maize. And uh, together with our Bayer colleagues, I also published uh, a, a comprehensive review on host plant resistance. Biological control, again, there is a lot of effort that's going on in both Africa and Asia. Over 150 parasitoids from 14 different insect families are known to offer uh, control against falami worm. But most of the countries are doing conservation biological control. Not much augmentative biological control uh, is in place right now. In case of biopesticides, again, Foligen is, uh, by AgBiotech, is doing very well. Uh, we enabled registration of Foligen by generating data uh, in South Sudan as well as in Bangladesh. And uh, this is, but in general, there are several constraints that are, uh, uh, that are there in terms of supply constraints, the cost constraints, the demand constraints. Many farmers are not even aware about some of these pesticides, and in some cases, the efficacy constraints. Uh, so all these need to be systematically overcome through interinstitutional uh, synergies. Uh, next one. Okay, this is another uh, potential option when we talk about integrated pest management, the mating disruption technology, the pheromone-based mating disruption technology. Uh, Ferogen uh, has been registered uh, by ProVivi in Brazil in August 2020, in Mexico in collaboration with CIMIT in September 2020, uh, in Kenya in April 2021, and most recently in Indonesia 
in March 2022. Uh, these typical dispensers are installed in multiple locations within the field, and they release a, a pheromone cloud, and in that cloud, uh, unfortunately, the, the males cannot identify, not unfortunately, fortunately. Uh, the males cannot locate the females and the mating disruption happens. When this method is typically used area-wide and over several crop seasons, you can expect to see a significant decrease in the pest population. These are two comprehensive manuals uh, submit together with USAID and several authors across multiple institutions in US, Europe, Africa, and Asia. Uh, we brought together first uh, in uh, 2018 uh, for Fala Miwa management uh, in Africa, and then most recently in 2021, we updated the information and uh, we brought out uh, a manual for Asia too. Uh, one of the most important things that we highlighted in this is to have transparent evaluation of components of Falamivam IPM uh, based on five specific criteria, cost, efficacy, safety, accessibility, and scalability. These five criteria are very, very relevant, especially in the smallholders context, uh, to, to, to co-create powerful IPM packages that are relevant for different socioeconomic conditions as well as agroecological conditions uh, in continents like Africa and Asia. We also need to overcome IPM adoption barriers uh, integrating different control tactics against Falamivam, or integrating different control tactics horizontally across different pest groups. Uh, for this, we would like to have plant health innovation platforms, which we started off in the recently initiated plant health initiative. Uh, I think that would be the next final slide. Uh, it's not moving. <laughs> Okay, gender and social considerations are extremely important when we are designing and scaling plant health innovations against transboundary pests. Uh, this is typically what is ignored and that is causing uh, under, under utilization of IPM. So we need system innovations uh, that take into account the relevance of women farmers, pr their preferences, what are labor saving and time saving, how can they manage within the budget and how do we bring women in the decision making when it comes to IPM so that our innovations are not just fixed, uh, but it could be adjusted very well uh, to the women farmers' uh, needs. So this is the CGIR Plant Health Initiative, uh, which has been launched in January 2022, uh, where all the CG centers which are working on different crops uh, together with CABI, ECPA, World Wedge, have come together uh, to, to have this, and FAO played a very critical role uh, in supporting the formulation of this proposal. My final slide, IPM is not just integrated pest management. IPM is actually integrating people's mindsets. Uh, that needs to happen. Uh, transboundary pests like Falamivam really humble us all. We think we know a lot. <laughs> but we are challenged by these pests uh, time and again. Farmers need effective, science-based, evidence-based, robust, and affordable tools to control pests like Falamivam. Enabling policies are very important to ensure those resource-constrained smallholder farmers gain rapid access to smart innovations. And we need to come together. There is no alternative. Institutional changes and the partnerships are vital to implement IPM including the public-private partnerships for a faster response. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thank you so much Prasanna, for this very interesting talk on the Forum Warm and how CIMIT is tackling this really real challenge for Africa. So now we will shift to a poll. So I will ask you to vote online uh, and so you will see quickly a slide appearing with some questions and you are asked to answer. So please play your role and uh, provide us with your feedback also. And of course, if you have additional questions, we will be very happy to take these que questions on board. So you have the questions and via the app, you can provide us with your feedback. And this will go on while we are also trying to tackle your, the questions that we have received.
And I guess that we will also take on board the questions. Yes. And maybe we will start with the question, which is, how do biosecurity agencies deal with internet trade being a potential source of invasive alien species? And this is for you, Len. Great, thank you. I don't know if I've switched on the microphone. Yes, I have, perfect, okay. Thank you very much. It's um, a really important question, and I think that um, the European Commission project that I mentioned that I'm working on with others in terms of communication and raising awareness, so one of the sectors we've been working with, well, a couple of the sectors that are relevant for this, is one is the pet trade, and one is the trade in, for example, aquatic ornamental plants, but it can be in also other plants as well. And they're really aware of the increasing pressure from internet trade and the way in which regulation of such trade is really difficult. And I think that while well, there can be pressure to some of the um, internet hubs, if you like, to put in regulations and to be responsible, I think it's also about raising awareness with the consumers that um, they should be buying from responsible sources and understanding where they're getting their materials from. And I think one of the issues as well with the internet trade is not um, the knowing selling of species that are banned, for instance, which is a problem, but also the selling of species that are mislabeled or misnamed, particularly for plants, for instance, people buying something that is different to what they, to receiving something that is different to that that they thought they were buying. So I think it is really huge challenges, but I think it's about raising awareness with the consumers and also putting pressure on the um, internet trade to ensure that they have responsible um, trading. Thank you, Alain. We have also another question, which is, how is rust pressure related to cropping practices? So, for example, very dense cultivation, which builds favorable conditions. How efficient are IPM measures as the prediction of rust population development via modeling? And this is for you, Anna. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the good question. Well, I think uh, the cropping practices uh, connecting with rust is maybe not the how dense you plant, but it could, all, it could be sowing time. If you plant early, the crop can be developed and infected quite late, and then the losses is uh, lower than if it gets infected very early. If you don't have the means of spraying, then, then you will not have the problem. Uh, that was the first question. And the second one, uh, uh, the IPM measures is basically which cultivar that you choose to uh, grow. Uh, and uh, based on modeling, uh, I didn't go into that uh, very much, but uh, uh, it's very, very difficult to know which rust that will appear next year. It could be the same as uh, the last year, but so we're always one step behind in analyzing the, the virulence genes. Uh, the way you can model uh, in during and uh, growing seasons is uh, via uh, climate and see how or weather and see how the winds are blowing and if they the current uh, rust uh, infections are spreading and how they are spreading across uh, certain areas. And I think that this uh, uh, is something that needs to be developed. Okay. And before shifting to the last questions, so we have your, your vote on what are the main challenges in using integrated pest and disease management globally. And clearly, uh, you vote for all uh, of the above here. Yeah. And so we will close this voting session. But we have interesting questions and we will take on board. Uh, on, on Falarmi worm, and maybe a first one, which is impressive work on the Falarmi worm resistant by his lines. However, how do these hybrids fare in terms of crop yields? So we do uh, typically go through a stage gate advancement process. We are not only breeding for Falarmi worm resistance, they also, for example, in the African context, need to be climate resilient. Simits, uh, on station, we have an extensive testing for various traits like drought, low nitrogen, various diseases. And uh, when we go through this process, we systematically reject that may have fallen worm resistance, but poor yield, and typically advance only those that can compete well with the commercial uh, checks in the market. So we ensure that uh, not only the operation is successful, but the patient is also alive and kicking. 
<laughs> so that is the first one. Uh, what measures are in place to prevent further spread of FA? And given that Fala Mivam is a polyphagous pest, is maize the only crop significantly impacting in Africa and Asia? Undoubtedly, this pest typically likes maize. Uh, around 85% to 90% of the damage we have seen in both and Africa is in the, in the maize fields. Uh, and then if maize is typically not available, then it goes to crops like sorghum and millets and vegetables. So maize is the one which is predominantly hit and then followed by other crops. But it doesn't mean that the, some of the tactics that we are talking about, uh, except host plant resistance, cannot be applied to the other crops. For example, mating disruption technology or biopesticides or biologically control, biological control agents are typically crop agnostic and uh, they can be very well used uh, together in the IPM strategy. Uh, and how do we prevent the further spread of falami bomb? Europe so far has been quite safe <laughs> in terms of <laughs> falami bomb. Inshallah, it stays like that. Uh, but uh, the constant vigilance is extremely important, especially in terms of intercepting the shipments. And there have been some cases already where falami bomb uh, contaminations could be seen and uh, those shipments destroyed. But there is nothing that we can predict. Uh, how could it reach all the way up to Australia? Uh, when Australia is so careful about uh, phytosanitary issues. So no guarantee that Europe will not be hit, but better, better be proactive and understand how to deal with this challenge in the years to come. Okay. okay. Is there any absurd negative effect of the pheromone cloud traps? No. Uh, not necess not at all. They don't, they don't in intercept. Uh, they, these pheromones are really uh, species-specific pheromones. Uh, they do not affect pollinators and others. So it's, it has been well proven. And may yeah, that's fine. Uh, may maybe just one last question. Uh, Ellen, you, you showed these curves uh, and this increasing numbers of, of introductions of alien uh, species. What are the main drivers? Uh, what, what is your view about this? Uh? So, uh, of course, trade has been really important. And we're seeing there's a very strong correlation between increases in global ch um, trade and the connections around the world, thing, you know, we're importing from further afield than historically was the case. And also the movement of people as well and goods with them. The, that movement is what is bringing um, the species from one place to another. And I think that actually the, what's really fantastic about uh, many of the fantastic things about this meeting is that collaboration amongst people that I think sometimes we're a bit siloed, where in the field of biological invasions, we're talking about the movement of species and species that are causing problems, and we don't talk enough around, with, for example, food security and agriculture and understanding lessons that we can learn from biocontrol and from other areas as well, like rewilding, restoration. There's so many opportunities for us to work um, together, but definitely the big driver is around um, the trade and the movement of people. But we're going to see with climate warming as well that some species are able to settle in places where they could not previously um, establish. And um, we're already seeing that, for example, the Argentine ant um, in the UK, the climate currently is not um, warm enough for it to really establish. But in London, it is. We see it's warmer in London, and now we're seeing populations of Argentine ant um, surviving the winter outside. So we're seeing, we have to deal with all of these global um, drivers of change together. We have to think about solutions for climate change that are also going to be solutions for biological invasions. And working in that kind of joined up way is, is what I've heard a lot about through this conference. Thank you. It's now time to thank the speakers for this uh, first morning session. And so thank you very much, Ellen, Anna, Prasanna. Uh, thank you for your contribution. And now we have time for coffee break. And maybe we will continue exchange in person. But please, those online, keep, keep with us. And, and we follow on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Once again, uh, and welcome back. Uh, to this second part of our session. Uh, while the first part was focusing on driver threats and impacts, we are now focusing on solutions. Uh, and 
I would like, first of all, also to remind you to please use uh, the conference app to interact with the other participants and with the speakers. So I hope this will also be uh, as interesting as uh, the previous session uh, with a stronger focus on uh, scientific, technological and social uh, programs that could support uh, challenges, the many challenges to, to plant health. But without any further ado, I would like to call on stage my colleague, uh, Pieter Beck. He's working at the Joint Research Center and he uh, has a background in ecology with a speciali specialization in remote sensing and modeling uh, of vegetation. And he, stu he studies the effects of uh, that climate and disturbance have on the seasonality, distribution, and growth of forests, and how can this be monitored uh, efficiently? The effects of this can be monit monitored efficiently. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna Cristina. Good morning, everybody. And thank you to this in, uh, EFSA for inviting me and the speakers this morning. I think who set the bar very high for the talks. Right, so I have to push hard, I'm told, right. <laughs> Last week it was 32 degrees in Brussels. It was uh, 43 in Biarritz, and it was hotter still in Madrid. This week we're lucky, and the heat wave took a bit of a break, but had we been outside here last week, we would have all have been sweating a bit more. But all over the city, and actually every city in Europe, you would have found, for free, cooling stations powered by solar energy. Let me match that here. Where trees are growing in uh, cities of Central Europe, the surface is on average 8 to 12 degrees cooler than that of the continuous urban fabric. And trees have a cooling effect on cities across Europe in summer, and particularly during extreme heat. They intercept sunlight, they use it to ev evaporate water and grow, rather than having it heat up the pavement that we walk, ride, or drive on, or the buildings we live in. And we will need trees as, and forests as our allies, because as we continue to load the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, temperatures will continue to rise, shown here in the latest IPCC report, um, and will extreme experience more days of extreme heat, as shown here by the projections of annual maximum and minimum temperature for a scenario of two degrees warming. Forests don't only physically provide cooling in specific areas such as cities, they also remove a good portion of the CO2, CO2 that we collectively dump in the atmosphere. Uh, they store it for decades, often centuries, in wood and soils. They sustain low-level cloud cover and rain in many parts of the world, and they're home to a large portion of the biodiversity on Earth. In short, trees play a major part in making and keeping our planet livable. So for the sake of the planet and for that of society, we should check in on them. We should check in on them on a regular basis to see how they're doing. Ideally, not just some of them, but all of them, and not on a one-off, but regularly. Moreover, trees themselves and forests are increasingly feeling the heat. This is mostly, most dramatically manifested in forest fires, which uh, here are evidenced also in areas that are more north on the globe that we don't typically associate with fire, here from Sweden in 2018. Since more than a decade, Europe has had a monitoring service for forest fires. It operationally monitors and maps every day all the forest fires in Europe that are bigger than 50 hectares as part of the Copernicus program. We do not currently have a similar service for other disturbances in forests. Fires put human lives at risk, but actually it are storms that damage most of the wood in Europe every year. But in the background, there's more gradual and perhaps more profound change than these very dramatic disturbance effects. The drought that affected most of northern and eastern Germany in 2018 depleted soil water to exceptional levels, including at deeper soil horizons, which you see here in the red map, which is a moisture index uh, from Hartmann et al. And the drought was followed by tree mortality events, which you see in the line graph, with Pinus sylvestris seeing tenfold increases in mortality rates and across species sevenfold increases. Scientists at the German Aerospace Center, DLR, 
use satellites to map the loss of forest canopy cover following those drought years. That's the map on the right. They estimate about half a million hectares of canopy cover was lost with large regional differences. But while this map aggregates at uh, administrative level, because they use satellite data, the results are incredibly detailed. So we zoom in here a second on the, let me get that right, on the Hartz Mountains. This is what their results actually look like. So the canopy cover loss was mapped at a resolution of 10 meters, because that's what the satellites allow. And the colors indicate precisely which month the detection was made. So we're reaching a level of both spatial and temporal detail that we couldn't have imagined a couple of years ago, thanks to new satellite technology. The interplay of drought and bark beetle outbreaks and salvage logging meant that the can canopy cover loss was dramatic, as you can see, um, characterized by clear cuts and standing dead trees. So to make another medical analogy, as far as the trees are concerned, the satellite-based mapping was post-mortem. But with the wealth of satellite data that we currently have available, we see in the uh, research field the attention increasingly moving to uh, near real-time detection. So every time a satellite passes over, it might take you a, an hour or two to get the image available on your computer and have it analyzed immediately. At the JRC, the Joint Research Center of the Commission, we recently put out an open and free software package that bundles existing tools for such near real-time analysis of satellite data for disturbances. So every time an image from Sentinel Two, for example, comes in, it would be analyzed to check if there might be a disturbance emerging and you could issue an alert, for example. And we have good reasons to be keeping a close eye on our forests. Other modeling work in our group shows that climate change will shift where trees can thrive in Europe. Super suitable habitats of individual species will be mostly opening up further north and higher elevations, which is colored in blue here. These are projections uh, for moderate emission scenario that we ran until the end of the 21st century. But it also means that at the warmer end of the distribution ranges, areas will become decolonized and trees will particularly struggle. That's shown in orange here for these three species. And it's particularly in those areas where we'll see large uh, changes in species composition and in forest structure play out. And often disturbances are the catalyst for these long-term changes. So how can we effectively and efficiently check in on forests for ongoing changes? Let me stress, there is no substitute for an expert checking things in the field, investigating a plot, and data being analyzed in the lab. And big multinational initiatives like ICP Forest, let me go back, they've been doing this for many years. They've been monitoring plots across Europe for 20 years and have accumulated a unique long-term perspective on tree health indicators. This map shows crown defoliation measured in 2019, and the red and black dots show where it's reached more than 40% of the canopy. But this is labor intensive, and we cannot be everywhere all the time, of course. And at the same time, satellites, both publicly operated ones, like from the Copernicus program of Europe, but also privately operated ones, provide increasing volumes of operations of observation, sorry, for the entire globe every single day and every more frequently. We have mm, increasing numbers of satellites in orbit, and when satellites cannot provide us the detail we need, aerial photography, both from manned and unmanned aircraft, is ever more easily to collect. You can literally launch them with your bare arm. At the same time, we see sensors that go on such small aircraft becoming miniaturized, easier to operate, and cheaper. So the real challenge that I see, and the opportunity before us, is to wisely combine data collected in the field and remote sensing observations. For Xylella fastidiosa, through work funded by the European Commission, when we collected data in the field, analyzed it in the lab, and simultaneously flew an aircraft with sensors low enough to see individual trees, which is the example you see there, and two sensors that are sensitive to the biochemical constituents in tree leaves, we found that we could detect symptoms of Xylella fastidiosa infection in olive trees before they were uh, visible to the naked human eye. That's one example 
and of course at the scale of orchards. If we want to think continent-wide and look at all the forests in Europe um, all the time, we'll need to reframe a bit, I think, how we collect data on them. Satellite data are unique in that they provide these up-to-date views of the entire planet at daily intervals, but of course they do not see everything, and they typically do not see the detail that is needed for early detection of pests. So to make best use of remote sensing data alongside other data sources and really benefit from this complementarity, I think also the way we collect data in the field and make it available to others should be designed considering also the link to remote sensing. To that end, as part of the Green Deal for Europe and specifically as part of the European Forest Strategy that was released last year, the European Commission has proposed to develop a new EU forest monitoring framework that will leverage both field and remote sensing observations jointly. At the Joint Research Centre of the Commission, where I work, we're committed to developing tools that can facilitate and catalyze the use of remote sensing for European forest monitoring. And I already mentioned some of the software we've put out to that end. Another initiative we've had is to bring together and publicly release ground observations on particular disturbances here on uh, wind disturbances. So we collected uh, ground observations, um, brought them in a harmonized format, and then made them publicly available to stimulate their use alongside remote sensing data. This example is from Slovakia, from a, a big wind storm event there in the Tatra Mountains in 2014. And right now we're working on a similar data set of insect and pest disturbances on forests. It's not yet out, but it will come to no surprise that the way these data are collected by different entities, researchers, and different parts of Europe is vastly different. If we want to scale up to really make a better link with what we can see from satellites, we'll have to at some point sit together and reflect how we better make those data intercomparable. So the message I want to leave you with is that to fully leverage Earth observation in understanding forest health, we should Consider the technology in the design phase of monitoring campaigns rather than as an afterthought, because that leads to frustration. I speak from experience. And we should make ground observations as easily and free freely accessible as satellite data are. Pushed by the US in uh, uh, about 15 years ago when they opened up their entire Landsat archive, which was really a landmark sensor and data series for Earth observation, they made that all freely available. It really raised the bar. Europe follows suit. The Copernicus data, what is captured by the Sentinel satellites, which is an entire fleet and constellation, is all freely and openly available. That's really pushing the remote sensing field forward. Um, if we can somehow keep level up how we share ground observations, I think then we really see mutual benefit from the technologies. To close, Many cities in Europe, here an example from London, but around the world, have public inventories of every single tree on their territory. Here's a, an individual cherry tree in London, but you could pick any tree from London. And in countries like the Netherlands, we see initiatives even and attempts to scale this up nationwide. Imagine if we had such an inventory for every tree on our continent, or at least every large mature tree on the continent, and what it would allow us to do for forest health. That's my invitation to you. I, I firmly believe that if we fully leverage remote sensing and, and what it offers now, that this is in the realm of possibilities uh, in a matter of, of years. Um, and I think it will allow us to check in on every tree on a regular basis and on every tree. So with that, thank you very much. very good and uh, uh, very clear presentation answering the question how uh, uh, if can, uh, remote sensing can help us understanding forest health in Europe uh, and also uh, potential developments uh, and, and uh, um, issues which on which we have to work uh, to uh, upscale the, the, the current uh, um, use of the tool uh, in this context. So thank you very much again. And I would like to welcome uh, Sarah Brunel to the stage. 
for a presentation on uh, tackling the protection of plants at source, uh, placing people at the center, so shifting uh, into a completely uh, different sub sub uh, subject, but obviously linked to uh, the context of our conference. And Sara Brunel is uh, an engineer in agriculture, and she has over 20 years of uh, knowledge at different uh, special scales, national, regional, and global, in plant protection. Um, and uh, she's currently an officer uh, responsible for the implementation and facilitation uh, at the um, International Plant Protection Convention. So thank you, Sarah, for accepting uh, to give this presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, EFSA. I'm very glad to be here. Very glad to be part of the solution, uh, because that's the theme of this session. And um, yes, indeed, I'm going to talk about something which is very complementary and which has been mentioned across all presentations. It's about people. It's about placing people at the center. And that's very compliant with the new FAO strategic framework, FAO uh, Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, Better Production better nutrition, better environment, better lives, and doing so, leaving no one behind. I was thrilled a few decades ago to be part of a, a keynote speech uh, by the professor Edward Wilson, if you know him, he's a famous sociobiologist, saying that we have uh, emotions of the paralytic, institution of middle age, and godlike technologies. And so our mission here is to bridge this gap in between us as human, our emotions, how we behave, and our technologies. And I'm going to try to give a few solutions on how we can do that. I will first explain um, what is the IPPC, International Plant Protection Convention. Um, what can we do nationally? What we do nationally through our phytosanitary capacity evaluation and what we can bring globally in terms of global trainings that countries are ready to integrate uh, at the national level. So first of all, the uh, international plant protection. We are based in Rome within the Food and Agriculture Organization. We are uh, part of the three sisters recognized by the um, World Organization for Trade along with Codex Alimentarius and uh, uh, Office International des Episodes aussi, now known as WOHA. And um, our mission is to protect global plant resources and facilitate safe trade. And we're really acting globally. You see we have 184 members, and we're working with uh, regional plant protection organization. EPO is one of them. Uh, Nico will be on the panel later as well as with uh, more than 40 other institutions. So nationally, we have a very efficient tool called the phytosanitary uh, capacity evaluation. And its peculiarity is that it's really nationally driven. We are sending facilitators so that the country really take ownership of what happens. We're only facilitating, not telling people what to do, but really making them understand what are their weaknesses and how they could build on them to develop a strategy. They choose everything. Uh, they invite stakeholders. We work through consensus workshop with the custom, the Minister of Environment, the producers, the importers, the exporters, maybe the army. And they are all around the table to define um, how to improve the phytosanitary system. They choose the modules. Uh, this is to say the aspects they want to work on. Uh, and that includes revising their law, um, working on their organogram, vision, mission, staff, and all the technical aspects they, have, they are dealing with in their National Plant Protection Organization. You see the diagnostic, surveillance, space risk analysis, import, export, etc. We've uh, implemented this tool across uh, the whole world in more than 60 countries in the last 20 years. And you see here on this map the last uh, countries uh, which implemented the tool in the last two years. You see that's really spread across uh, the whole world, dealing either with the law, either with all the aspects. 
and I want to give you a little um, update on what happened in Nicaragua. So I'm bringing you to Central America. That's, I think, one of the most successful project I ever implemented. Uh, they implemented this uh, PCE through a FAO project, having all the stakeholders around the table. They revised their law, they developed uh, their national phytosanitary capacity strategy. They have now clarity on where they want to be, what they want to do, how they want to reach that, how to approach donor and mobilize resources. And uh, the real achievement is that after three months after the completion of that project, they revised their phytosanitary law. Uh, that seems very difficult, though we can do it. We're working with lawyers uh, within FAO. That also happened in Comoros. And they went over, since they learned how to revise the law, they also revised their uh, animal health law and food safety law. And in that sense, that's a real example of achieving One Health. We are, within the IPPC Secretariat, involved in One Health in the FAO community. And uh, we're also working hand in hand with our food safety colleagues. Catherine, my colleague, is here. Uh, and we are very glad that the European Commission is now financing a multi-million project in uh, Africa to be conducting both phytosanitary capacity evaluations and uh, food safety assessments. So that's an example of a real collaboration. So that's what happens at the national level. We work with them so that they understand what is their mission, how they should achieve it, how to retain staff, and what are their training needs, and their legal basis is set. Then comes the question, uh, and that's our question, that's our mission at the global level. How can we provide useful, long-lasting, sustainable information and trainings for these countries? Now they are ready to receive uh, that, that data, that, that knowledge, that training. So in 2020, when COVID arrived, we had to organize some face-to-face -face workshops in Africa, and we realized that would not be possible because COVID would stay for a long time. And so we wondered, how can we leverage digital to efficiently deliver IPPC implementation and capacity development activities? And to answer that question efficiently, we um, commissioned a, what we call a design thinking study, um, which consists in undertaking uh, interviews with our target audience, so our national plant protection organizations, and we learned about that approach, which is really placing the human at the center, knowing what they want, what they need, so we would deliver the best thing. Um, Uber, for instance, is an example of um, aligning your service with your client needs, having a little bottle of water, having the person coming to you, and uh, having this app. So an example of a very flexible uh, service answering the customer needs. And design thinking, indeed, is not a process, but that's really a state of mind of placing people at the center. So our first uh, achievement in that uh, study was to understand who is our target audience. And to do so, we identified what we called persona. A persona is a fictitious person representing a group of your target audience. And we identified three, so the politician, the best in class and the pragmatic. So let me introduce briefly this person. And these persons work in the National Plant Protection Organization. So the politician is usually the head of the NPPO, having sometimes a, a political mandate. Uh, that's a person who um, is very well connected through internet, has equipment, knows what the IPPC secretariat does, know where to find information. Um, and uh, would like to stand in the continent as uh, a country really achieving things. So that's one of our target public. The other one is what uh, we identified as the best in class. That's usually a head of service. Uh, you see the legislation officer, surveillance officer. So they still are well connected. Uh, they manage a group of people, so they will be able to share the training material with them. They are not so close to us, uh, don't know as well as the politician or the head of NPPO knows about our activities, 
but still they visit our website and they keep in touch. And the third, who is a pragmatic, is the person really work, living and working in the field, not so well connected, uh, not knowing really what we do, and um, needing maybe more paper documents to, to be really uh, trained, uh, rather than having uh, something uh, very uh, virtual. And so we had that knowledge of who we're talking to and what are their different needs and characteristics. Uh, the study also gave us some ideas on how to reach these three uh, persona very efficiently. One idea was to have a targeted training on our website. Another idea is to enhance communication through uh, new media, new channels, so WhatsApp, social media, the website. Another proposal was to develop a gamified training app. And another proposal was to have simplified and adapted materials. So let me take you through the first proposal, having a targeted training. So we had a little story about that. So the head of the NPPO uh, welcomes new staff. Um, if you are from an NPPO, you know there's a high turnover usually, so you need to train constantly uh, new staff. So it's, it might be hard to be uh, developing a training each time. So what we could offer as IPPC Secretariat would be something on our website where you choose the category, I have a new surveillance officer, what is available for them on the website? So you choose that, you're able to send them uh, through WhatsApp or through any other mean that information, they receive it, and you're updated very frequently on new training topics, like we as IPVC Secretariat are sending this information. Uh, you receive even explanatory videos, there are forums for discussion on the topics, and um, you're able to uh, discuss at the NPPO level their achievement, maybe uh, select one of uh, your staff who could be a trainer for others, and exchange on that have your uh, yearly evaluation and have uh, this certification from our trainings. So that was the pitch, that was the scenario. And we've advanced since two years on this story to implement it. So, so far we've, dev we've developed uh, four e-learning courses which are now available. Uh, one on pest risk analysis and that was developed in collaboration with the COLEACP or Comité de Liaison Europe Afrique Carré Pacifique. Um, we also have another new training on surveillance and reporting obligations developed with the FAO eLearning Academy, and two other trainings are coming on export certification systems and inspection. Our um, um, courses, uh, you see the, the one on surveillance here, um, they are uh, very practical, indicating the timing you need to be filling in that, um, that course, and it delivers a little badge, which you can put on, on LinkedIn as well. So everything is very well connected. And um, soon we will be working with the FAO Learning Academy. So these trainings could enter into the curriculum of some universities across the whole world. So we're going in that direction. Um, I also want to flag that here, I'm only reflecting on our new courses but uh, we have a lot of uh, guides and training materials available on our website. You can consult them at that link. Um, for instance, um, there was a question before in the question session about e-commerce. So we just developed, uh, we, will, we will be uh, developing a new guide on e-commerce, a new guide on ISPM 15 on wood packaging, um, many things, many things are going on. So I invite you to visit our web page for all the guides and training material. Uh, visit the International Phytosanitary Portal in general. That is where you find all the international standards for phytosanitary measures. And visit our phytosanitary capacity evaluation web page as well. Uh, and I really wish we will achieve what uh, Dr. Earl uh, mentioned as the collaboration 2.0, uh, 
um, where we will be able to collaborate further with EFSA and with any organization here present. So I'm here the whole day. Please come to me, discuss uh, to get more information. I will be thrilled to enter into a, a real human interaction. Thank you very much. ask you to take a seat here on the stage. Thank you. So thank you very much for this uh, uh, very uh, important information about the work of FAO, IPPC, uh, linking to people, uh, raising awareness, engagement, and capacity building. We are now switching to a, a different type of presentation, some sm small, uh, short pitch uh, presentations. Um, by two speakers. Uh, they will be both online. I think, uh, uh, yeah, they're both, I got the confirmation. The first speaker will be Lorenzo Martini. He's a... Mari Marini. Marini, so <laughs> sorry for the mistake. Uh, he's uh, from the University of uh, Padova, and he is working on tools and monitoring uh, data. Uh, to assess the impact of multiple pesticides. So, um, Lorenzo, the floor is yours, wherever you are. <laughs> I don't see. I don't see my slide. Do you see my slide? Uh, not yet. Uh, we can see you on screen, but... Yeah, I'm uh, okay. Okay, now it's fine. Okay, thanks yes. a lot. Slides are on. Uh, yeah. I will present the, the Hopi project that is an ongoing project uh, founded by, by EFSA. Uh, we lost you, I see. Yeah, it's not... Going forward. Uh, can you uh, click uh, to? Yeah, next slide is. Yep. Okay. You just have to ask for the next slide. I think it will be operated from here. Uh, yeah, because it's not going. Uh, so, next slide. Okay, so. Please, next. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> so the aim of the, op the, the, of the OPI project is to identify a spot of future exotic pest introduction. So basically, an hotspot can be defined as a, a locality or a site where the probability of introduction and establishment of exotic species is the highest. So here, just as an example, you can see a recently published uh, uh, hotspot map for Europe, where you can see basically warm color, the places where the probability of introduction is the highest. However, all these uh, um, hotspots uh, are basically uh, built on environmental suitability. So basically, this author uh, compare the suitability of Europe uh, with the characteristic of the environment uh, where the exotic species live in their native range. So next. So uh, what they li lack is basically a link uh, to, the, um, to the trade and to the trade flows. Next. So we know very well that exotic pests and pathogens are strongly linked to trade. And here is just an example of the, uh, what happened to the global trade network in the last couple of years. So basically here you can see in, uh, in red uh, uh, trade uh, flows that has changed and reduced post-COVID and in green uh, interaction that has increased. So in a couple of years, uh, we can see a drastic shift in, uh, in trade partners and in trade volume. And we know very well that is strongly related then to the uh, introduction of pest and pathogens. So next. Uh, so this is the main reason why we decided to uh, change the approach that was usually followed by hotspot analysis by incorporating the trade data. Uh, 
So our approach was to combine three different databases that uh, have been combined for the first time. So the first one is the AOL fit, where we have time series data on interception. So basically we know which species were intercepted in which point of entry on uh, which commodity. And then we have the AOL stat data about uh, uh, the trade. So basically we know in for the same uh, period of time, last 20 years, all the trade that has uh, occurred between European countries and the rest of the world. So we could in this way combine and see if the interception were correlated with the volume of the trade and a specific pathways. And so uh, using this combination of database, we are able basically to quantify the propagal pressure for a single species or for a group of species that share the same pathway, basically. Next. So what we can do and our ambition is to produce then hotspot map for single species or for a group of species by combining these two components. From, from one side, we have the propagal pressure that is mostly linked to the trade. And second, the climate suitability. So climate suitability is historically done using species distribution modeling. So very straightforward. We can select a species, then we can look at the pathway of the species, and then we can link the trade to the probability of introduction, so the propagal pressure. And then we can combine that with the climate suitability of that species. That is basically telling us if which part of Europe is suitable for establishment of this species. So next. So if we... If we succeed with that, uh, we can produce a very uh, um, interesting tool uh, that can work at the species level. So this is the major advance of our approach is to go from a multi-species hotspot to a single species hotspot. And of course, this hotspot can inform a PRA. And in particular, the, the major aim of HOPI is to incorporate this hotspot analysis into the quantitative PRA. So basically, the idea is to give a solid scientific base to estimate the probability of introduction of single species. Second, mm -hmm. it will uh, also inform surveillance. So basically where we should concentrate our effort to detect uh, new species. And finally, so what we, uh, what we do is to, uh, next, uh, click, okay, is to, uh, uh, try to reduce the risk of introduction by improving our ability to predict where these introductions are going to happen. And thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Yuri. Um, yeah, thank you for keeping the time. I couldn't uh, see, you start a bit late and I couldn't see if you could see me indicating the time uh, was getting was over, but thank you very much for keeping the time and nice presentation. Nice to hear about uh, results of the Hopi project. So um, the next speaker will be um, also online. It is Dr. Claire Dole. I oh, know, sorry, getting uh, things mixed up uh, too early for um, Claire, but it's Victoria is Valenci. Uh, and Victoria um, is uh, um, a facilitator at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, and uh, as well as an event supporter and rapporteur with the International Fund for Agriculture Development. Victoria is online, I can see you. Uh, so please uh, go ahead with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone, and good morning. It is with pleasure that I have the chance to present to you the International Year of Plant Health Youth Declaration, which was drafted on behalf of 26 youth organizations across the globe. The General Assembly of the United Nations declared 2020 the International Year of Plant Health, mandating FAO and the Secretariat of the International Plant Protection Convention to promote this year globally. As one of the legacies of the International International Year of Plant Health. The purpose of this declaration is to support the role of plant health in achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development by uniting the voices of those young and young at heart who demand the transformative actions laid out in this declaration be implemented on a worldwide scale. As we know, plants are the foundation for life on Earth and their protection is essential to avoid further damage to our climate, biodiversity, and overall ecosystem. 
It is for these reasons that youth have come together and defined seven thematic areas in order to ensure the sustainability of plant life. Through the collection of consistent and accurate data, we call for specific phytosanitary considerations to be included in the One Health approach. We also call for an SDG indicator for plant health to monitor its progress as part of food security and biodiversity related goals. We encourage leaders to develop a unified phytosanitary agenda by 2030. We advocate for the improvement of sustainable agricultural practices, such as pest management and coordinated global strategies. We call on the private sector as well as governmental bodies to promote sustainable financial principles in line with the IPPC standards by 2030. Number three, we encourage for recognition towards indigenous cultures, languages, and practices, which are essential to safeguarding plant systems. Therefore, we reaffirm the duty of all stakeholders to contribute to preserving indigenous knowledge systems. Four, we, str we strongly encourage that women, local communities, and those vulnerable to risks are recognized and supported by the international community to ensure the necessary legislation is enacted to protect their rights and practices regarding natural and plant resource management by 2030. We affirm the importance of utilizing seed banks for enhanced protection of underutilized species by encouraging a rights-based approach to protect to plant health by governments. Number five, we highlight the relevance of harmonized international cooperation for phytosanitary measures that help improve the trading of plants and plant products, which encourages safe and sustainable practices. We ask all actors involved in the international trade of plants and plant products to commit to the full application of the international standards for, phyto for phytosanitary measures. Number six, we encourage the importance of strengthened education systems on plant health, which allow for a global effort on knowledge transfer and promotion of sustainable agricultural methods. We urge stakeholders to integrate plant health research into all phytosanitary training programs by 2030 while recognizing the differences of national context. And finally, in order to implement these changes, we demand that capital flows and funding of plant health are increased threefold by 2030 on a worldwide scale. We encourage donors to ensure adequate staffing and availability of equipment. Therefore, on behalf of the International Year of Plant Health Youth Team, we hope you enjoy the declaration and encourage you to sign it and share it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Vittoria, for this uh, presentation and keeping the time. Uh, we are uh, at the end of the presentation session. We move into the question and answers. Uh, there will be a poll uh, which will be launched in the next seconds. You will be seeing it online, actually, it's already online, and you are all asked here and uh, online to answer to this question. Should the assessment of spread and impact of emerging pe pests consider the pests' impact on natural ecosystems and ecosystem services? There are some alternative answers there, yes but with a primary focus on the impact on agriculture production. Yes, uh, including equal the impact on agro systems and natural ecosystems. No, well, I'm not sure. Please take your decisions. In the meantime, I switch uh, into uh, interaction with our speakers, uh, with Peter and Sarah here, but also Lorenzo and Vittoria will be welcome to um, interact. We have received uh, uh, some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I'll pick up one. Um, and this is uh, mainly directed to Peter. How long would it take for another species to take over uh, those, the forest lands that you have nicely shown on on maps in your presentation. 
uh, and how long it will take for um, uh, colonization by other species if left to natural uh, development processes, I suppose. Yeah, okay. Um, well, that is one heck of a question. Um, <laughs> Because I think the examples that I've shown uh, with bark beetle damage, for example, and then salvage harvesting uh, following it, which is very common in Europe, in many, um, many countries, well, several countries actually have uh, put a stop on regular planned logging, um, and all their logging is basically salvage logging right now. For example, in the Czech Republic for, uh, for spruce, that is the case. Um, but that said, in, in principle, those, those natural disturbances or forests are often part of a natural cycle. But I think what we're seeing is, which also implies that, that species are adapted to it and regeneration will follow. But I think what we're seeing now is um, disturbances at a scale which is um, new, at least for us, not necessarily for the system. And that disturbs some of those uh, uh, successional dynamics that we've uh, come to rely on. So I don't think there's a there's a single answer, of course, because it depends very much on the on the system, uh, on on more managed systems. I think what we do need to consider is that um, not only do we have larger disturbance events, uh, so more dramatic impacts, for example, on forestry practices, but at the same time, the suitability of the species that typically grow there might be challenged by the climate, right? So business as usual in terms of replanting spruce, where we had spruce in Central Europe, might eventually not work anymore because you don't need to plant what will grow now. You need to plant in forestry what will thrive in 40, 50, 60 years. And the projections um, are worth checking because for some species at the southern end of their distribution range, we need, really need to reconsider what, uh, what will thrive there by the end of the century. So those are a bit my reflections on that, uh, on that question. Thank you, Peter. Um, we have uh, a question for Sarah directly. Um, the question is, as humans and other li animal life uh, completely depends directly on, indirectly on plants, should educational systems make it a priority for the mandatory teaching of plant-based food chains in schools? Thank you, yes. Uh, thank you, Andrew Planet. That's a very good question. So I will go reverse uh, in the age of when we can give that training. We as IPPC Secretariat, we are working to train NPPO staff, so professionals, because indeed there is not really a training related to plant health. Uh, many people, agronomists or univer in universities, they didn't get that information of what is the IPPC, what is plant health. And that's really when they are hired by the NPPO that they are learning uh, the job, what is surveillance, pest risk analysis, etc. So that's why our first target as of now is to develop the tools, the guides, the courses, so that the professionals can get that information. Our next step will be to make these courses available in universities and uh, training courses. And we're doing that already with the FAWI Learning Academy, having a network of 700,000 people trying to uh, include these courses. And then, of course, if we go reverse, um, that um, awareness, that passion for plant and plant protection would need to, to be given before uh, in the youth. And I think uh, the declaration that uh, Victoria presented uh, is very on the topic that uh, the youth, uh, they want apparently this, uh, this information, this training. So that encompasses a, a wide range of uh, relationship with the green and plants. Uh, food, being in nature, having shut gardens, and uh, I'm faithful that the society now is providing this type of uh, sensitization to the environment more and more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. 
Uh, we are now closing the pool. Uh, we'll soon see some results online, but uh, maybe uh, while we s uh, disappear, oh, they are already there. So um, uh, I think there's a vast uh, ma majority of uh, responses um, uh, indicating that uh, um, there's uh, a need for including equally the impact of agro-systems and uh, natural systems. Uh, I don't know if the speakers, all speakers, any of the speakers also online would like to comment on uh, this answer and uh, um, in relation to the question that was posed on the poll. I can maybe uh, ask one of our speakers online, uh, Victoria, or Lorenzo. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I can't actually see the, the question so clearly. Could the, uh, the question be placed online again, the poll question? Or perhaps in the chat, I don't know if that's an Should option. the assessment of spread and impacts of emerging pests consider pests' impact on natural ecosystems and ecosystem services? Maybe something more for Lorenzo, actually, than Victoria. Yeah, I fully agree with the, with the response from the audience. I think it's crucially important that we, we should look also at the natural ecosystem as well, because uh, I've, I've been put a lot of emphasis on agriculture, and uh, that's good. Or, or forest, but there are now emerging problems, uh, in particular in forest with, with pest and pathogen that are, is really, really uh, worrying us. So I, I definitely agree with, with that view. Okay, so there is time for one uh, last question. Um, and I think I will pick up one from the audience. Are citizen science data useful and included in such big data collections as uh, uh, shown by at least you, Lorenzo, uh, and also Peter. I think maybe, Lorenzo, again, you could start, and all others are invited to also uh, yeah, provide feedback. Science, uh, yeah, it's definitely one important source of information, but at least uh, in Europe is still uh, quite far away from like being able to, to use this data for the analysis that we are doing. So I think uh, we should try to uh, involve people and do more. Uh, I think we have now the tools to do that, but uh, most of these systems and science are still uh, in biodiversity conservation kind of area. So I think it's, it's very important that we should move and involve these people that are dealing with conservation also in the uh, in plant protection. I think this is very, uh, the, the times are mature uh, to do that, I think, and we have the technological tools uh, as well to do it. Do you, Peter or Sarah, share this? Yeah, view? maybe in the, in the domain of remote sensing and, and the modeling work I touched on, there's definitely a use of citizen science. Uh, there are initiatives, for example, uh, by YASA, amongst others, to where anybody can go online and help uh, validate what algorithms see in satellite images. Uh, combine it with images of very high resolution and you can check, yes, this is a palm plantation, for example, uh, in, uh, in Indonesia, or no, the algorithm got it wrong. Um, so uh, the crowd in that way is being leveraged to support fine-tuning of algorithms. Um, when it comes to species distributions, um, also there, there are, there are big initiatives uh, where citizens, more or less experienced ones, can submit observations through far smartphones supported by AI that then also helps check the pictures taken of a particular plant. More experienced citizens can check and help uh, train less experienced ones. So definitely there's initiatives, I think, across the board. My point is, I don't think we should shift the burden of, of data collection and sharing too much to the citizen. I think there's a lot of um, uh, organized, government-funded data collection ongoing, and, and, and part of my pitch is to, to think how we can make that more available uh, across the modeling community. Very quick, Sarah, because we have to uh, hand over to the 
panel discussion. Thank you. Yes, just to mention, uh, citizen science is a fantastic opportunity to involve uh, and raise awareness uh, of the general public and the civil society. And in that regard, we really hope the International Year of Plant Health helped uh, share the message of the importance of plant and plant protection. And just to let you know that now, the 12th of May has been declared as the International Day of Plant Health, and we invite you to celebrate it widely every year. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. I think it was a nice... Uh, it, we end up the, this uh, session very nicely with your statement. Uh, you are all invited, of course. Now, for real, I hand over <laughs> the session uh, to Dr. Claire Dole, which will moderate the uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much, Anna. I always wanted to be a doctor. In fact, I managed a postgraduate diploma in journalism. So just to put the record straight, I haven't yet got that doctorship. Um, we've had so many polls this morning and really interesting results. There was one last week which EFSA put on Twitter. I don't know whether any of you participated in it, but it asked, what is the big threat to plant health in the next decade? And the options were circulation of people, increasing trade, diversity loss. Interestingly, climate change came out top, followed by increasing trade. So obviously they hadn't heard Helen's presentation about the impact of these biological invasions on biodiversity. And as we've heard, it's been very worrying this morning hearing about all the threats. And we're now going to look at some of the threats, but also some of the solutions. And I'm delighted to be joined by a very distinguished panel. So let me ask, first of all, Nico Horn, Director General of the European and Mediterranean Plant Protection Organization. Nico, perhaps you'd like to take the seat right at the end. Many of you may know what EPPO does. It's got 52 members, it's intergovernmental, and it is all about cooperation in plant health and we'll hear more from Nico in a moment. Uh, I'm delighted also to be joined by Mylona Panagiotta, who's a plant health specialist at DG Sante, and is in the unit on crisis preparedness in food, animals, and plants. Mylona, welcome. Please do take a seat next to Nico. We have Max Schulman, a Finnish arable farmer and a member of Copper Kojeka, the united voice of farmers and agro-cooperatives in the EU, according to your website. Thank you very, very much. And we are also joined by Elisabeth Marchente, who's going to join us online. So let's just check that Elisabeth is with us. She coordinates a research group, hello, at the University of Coimbra in Portugal, and interestingly focuses on invasive alien plants and has been involved in the first biocontrol agent against in invasive alien plants in Portugal. And we've been hearing so much about citizen science. Well, Elisabete is a big advocate of citizen science. So, Elisabete, welcome. Thank you. Good. Good and uh, we will be talking to you in a moment. So, as if we're not depressed enough, let's just start with a few of the risks. Um, and uh, at EPO, of course, you are uh, monitoring some of these risks of pests that come from outside of the 52 member states into, and of course, the risks of biological invasions within countries, if I've understood uh, Nico correctly. So, what are the trends, and are they getting worse? Yeah, it's uh, quite, thank you for giving me the floor on this. It's quite interesting you uh, uh, quoted the remark of EFSA last week. Uh, of course, we are seeing a lot of threats, and it has also been presented today. Uh, worldwide trade 
and also uh, human uh, traveling are certainly a threat. But what we have seen, and in that sense we are living in an interesting time, uh, there are mo is more and more awareness of climate change. So I can imagine that that was put also very high. But basically I think this puts an extra dimension to the threat. Because we are used to assess the thousands of pests that are potentially a risk on the basis of what we knew. We are using climate models, but basically now we also have to use climate models that give an extra uncertainty on how is it in 10 years. So uh, I very well uh, understand that climate uh, change was put on, on the top, but uh, we should um, realize that it's a combination of uh, trade, people traveling, uh, uh, and that was presented also in the different presentations, that form a threat and the challenge is to find uh, the pests that are most of a threat to us and focus on these and as was told also this morning, work preventively on them. And are we seeing numbers increase of those pests that do present a threat? Over the past 30, 40 years, we have clearly seen an increase in the numbers of pests. And, uh, and therefore, it's also good to know that, uh, of course, EPO is working on that, but an organization like EFSA and there are other organizations are also working on the same issue because it's impossible for uh, one organization to cover to cover this all. We have to collaborate on this. Yeah, absolutely. One of the points uh, made uh, earlier by one of our speakers about uh, the threats are so great, uh, there's not one solution, there's not one or organization. Um, Elisabetti, um, tell us a little bit, because perhaps it's less known, about the biological invasions of plants and, and the scale of the, of the problem that the world is facing, or at least what you're facing in Portugal. Oh, well, good morning. Uh, I think Ellen Roy put the, the scene very well in the morning and um, invasive alien species and, and plants also are uh, a huge threat to biodiversity, one of the main threats to biodiversity, according to the, the 2019 IPES report. But they are also a very big threat, uh, and including in Europe, to our economy. There are some recent studies that um, estimate the costs of damages and uh, also of uh, management of uh, invasive species. And these are, are huge, uh, at least uh, 116 um, billion euros between 1916 and 2020. And this is not only for plants, it's alien species uh, in general. Uh, and uh, a large part of these costs are associated to agricultural and forestry and, of course, including plant health. And uh, there are many, many plant pests and pathogens that are directly affecting plant health, but also the invasive plants because they are um, invading areas that are used by agriculture, so they are weeds and they are crop production and uh, forest production. And um, it's not only uh, for uh, crop plants, but it's also for the wild plants because invasive alien plants are invading the natural ecosystems the, uh, and not only the affecting the species, but the functioning and the service that these, system, these ecosystems provide. So it's huge, the, the impact they have, even uh, on public health. Several species have um, allergenic pollen or they harm us in uh, other ways. And uh, at European level and worldwide, the number of uh, species that um, are introduced and the ones that establish and spread are increasing and continue to increase despite all the, the measures to prevent them and try to uh, decrease the, the entrance of these species. And uh, uh, as been said in the morning with the globalization and trade and internet trade, all these numbers continue to, to increase. So also the impacts are expected to increase in the future, unfortunately. And as Elisabetti said, there's uh, consequences for human health, but also, of course, for uh, the farmers. Uh, you're facing you know, the risks of uh, more pests, uh, more plant in, in, in invasions. 
Tell us a little bit about the impact from your perspective. Yes, thank you very much. And I have to thank you all the keynote speakers. I think they were all excellent. And they actually brought down the problem and the problematic situation down to the earth, down to where I, as a farmer, would look. And I think that's one thing that we have to remember. It is something that is there all among us. For sure, I am as a farmer, I look at the fields. But at the same time, I also look outside the fields. Because like we heard, you have there also certain plants that might be hosting a disease. You might have there something that might host a pest. So we are looking at the full agro-environmental area, but also the ecology outside it. So I think it was very well done in the last poll that people really recognized that we have to look at the whole picture. But the thing is that we have to look a little bit further out. The farmer usually looks at his own region, his own area, his own fields, etc. But as we have heard, most of these things today, they travel. But for sure, without telling us from where and when, they don't book a flight and say, I will land in Europe this and this day. We don't see that. So for us, it's extremely important as farmers that we do have there a good early warning system in place. That involves academia, it involves the trade that is dealing with these kind of commodities that are coming in. We also need the citizens, we need the farmers involved in it, and extension services. So we actually need a huge amount of people involved in this. And I think today we have the means to do it through the digital tools. They have to be simple and easy. So that we as farmers can really react on time to be able to do something about it before we have all a disease that is widely spread already and it, nothing can really be done. Or that we have their pest that has come in that we have not noticed. And the next crop year, you can already see that it is a huge invasion, like we also saw already in Helen's uh, presentation. So we need this information. We are the ones that need to take care of it in a way. But to do that, we need tools. So let's come back then to the tools later on. But one thing I can say, I was very glad that plant breeding has been lifted so highly on the list. Because sometimes I feel that that is somehow a little bit missed and lost here inside the EU. Thank you. So thank you already talking about how we can prevent and anticipate and some of the things that we can do. And we're going to uh, look at that in a moment. But first, let's bring in another poll. And if you can see on the screen, uh, and it's not that poll, it's the next poll, which uh, should, because I think we know the answer uh, for that one, if I can uh, remember it correctly. Uh, yes, indeed. How are we going to halt these biological in in invasions? And as you can see, there are a number of all opportunities there. Reinforcing plant health monitoring activities. Are we going to talk a bit about that? Import controls, phytosanitation. Sanitary, uh, research initiatives on detection and control methods, uh, supporting organic agriculture, or all of the above, which of course is the easy one to tick. But it would be good to see what the results are as they come in. So let's keep an eye on that as you vote. But I'm going to bring in my loner to the uh, conversation, uh, the solution, uh, DG, uh, DG Sante. Um, so what's being done uh, at your level in terms of uh, legislation to halt biological invasions? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, very interesting uh, presentations we had this morning. Uh, well, uh, in the EU, since uh, the end of 2019, we have an, uh, a new legislative framework and uh, there are a number of actions and activities that are put in place based on this framework. And what I would like to start first with uh, early warning. Early warning and prevention is in the basis of the philosophy of this legislation. So we have a number of activities which facilitate the recognition of threats. Because there are many pests around. Are they all relevant for a region? This is, this is the question. And for doing that, the, we have in place horizon, horizon uh, scanning activities for our region. We have the outcome of horizon scanning activities from EPO and EFSA. The, uh, this is, uh, th these are activities that are going through the media, they're going through the literature, they're showing changes in patterns on, 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 on pests. 
And the, uh, this, uh, the outcome of this activity is discussed monthly in the relevant uh, technical committee. It results in actions uh, which could be step up the surveillance, step up the import controls, or if needed, add a new pest in the list of the already regulated union quarantine pests. So um, then, um, as, as we said, uh, the, there are the monitoring activities, surveillance, surveillance of the territory is a very important aspect of uh, knowing which pests are there or not there, because that's why for a number of pests which we have regulated in our list, we don't want them, they're regulated there because they, they pose an, a serious um, uh, threat for, for uh, the agriculture and the environment, because these are both aspects that they are looked at for making a decision in an area of adding a pest as, as a regulated pest as such. And on the top of it, we have the import control, step up import controls of all these traded commodities. Traded commodities, they travel with a certificate, what we call as phytosanitary certificate, giving assurance that they are free of all these uh, regulated pests as such. In addition to that, uh, we, we uh, have to uh, say that everybody's role is in keeping and informing, this is what the speaker said, informing everybody. Awareness raising is, is very important, not only for uh, the operators, the, the knowledge public, but for the broader pu public as such. And these are all uh, activities that they are in place. Travelers, the, uh, the issue of travelers without knowing, bringing in pests and so on. Now uh, there is legislation in place that requires that everything that comes outside uh, from the EU should be um, accompanied by these very same phytosanitary certificates and so on. So all these aspects that we have been touched upon this morning, they are uh, um, part of, the, of this new legislative framework as, as such. Thank you. Let's see what our audience uh, think are absolutely uh, key. And I think we can see that it's supporting research initiatives on detection and control methods against plant health threats. And we will certainly look at uh, pest control, pesticides, biological uh, agents, uh, some interest in supporting organic agriculture. Uh, we can hear your views, uh, Max, on that. And of course, all of the above uh, is a favorite for some of you. Max, just picking up on what uh, was said there by Melona about uh, trade and import controls, because I think we also heard from Helen that trade is just getting faster and uh, faster. So in, in terms of phytosanitary uh, measures, uh, are, are they enough? Uh, does something else need to, to be done so that we can make sure that we're really keeping up with the speed of global trade flows? I would say that yes, as long as the information reaches into the legislators so that they can keep them up to date, the phytosanitary measurements and, and uh, what are really needed to fulfill at the time. And I think here it is goes more globally as the trade is global, when at least when it comes into cereals, raw materials coming in and out, they move all over the world, millions of tons, small, big vessels all over. I mean, it's a very good way of bringing in disease, pests, etc. So we need to make sure that intragovernmental information is flowing as well. And I think that was one thing that was mentioned quite well. You have their FAO uh, looking into it, WTO coming in. I mean, there is plenty of these international ones. They have to then be able to inform the local governments. I mean, here, the commission. But then it comes the tricky thing. The commission or the legislator has to be fast to act because these guys don't wait at the harbor. These guys, they come in immediately when the vessel is there. You have detected it. You cannot just then sit and wait for a week or two weeks before you will put up a measure and say, OK, we have to do this. It has to be very fast. And I'm not sure that our legislation today do have this kind of a possibility to do it fast enough. Because we have seen that there has been diseases coming in through the trade that actually has been quite widely spread, diabrotica or something like this, before anything has been really put in place to do something about it. Well, let me ask my loner and Nick, are we faster? Are we fast enough? <laughs> 
I, th I think there's one thing we have to consider, and that's uh, we've all learned that also from the COVID-19 period. Decisions have to be taken in uncertainty. And uh, the, I think uh, legislators should be able to take quick action, but then we should also not uh, uh, criticize them for having taken action too quickly. <laughs> because that's uh, what we have all seen in the past two years. Uh, so having the flexibility of taking measures quickly is important, but then also adjust them if needed, if more information becomes available. And therefore, I think in that sense, uh, legislators have to work based on the knowledge they have, which is sometimes limited, especially for pests that are not present in our region. So I think we all have to play a role. We have seen that also this morning, the researchers, uh, the, the risk assessors, and the risk managers. So I think in the end, a good collaboration between these parties is needed, all playing their own role, uh, so that indeed decisions by the legislator or the policy maker can be taken quickly. Mm. Mylona, that's an interesting point, isn't it? We saw during COVID that, in fact, the, the vaccines were being developed. Somebody once said to me from the pharmaceutical industry, we're building the plane while we're flying it. And I'm just uh, wondering from your uh, p perspective, how do you get that balance right between making decisions, fast enough decisions, because as Max says, these pests, they know no borders, they come in fast, but making accurate uh, decisions? Yes, thank you very much. There is the possibility to move fast if we take emergency measures, as you know. Uh, but um, we have to have information that a found pest is a pest of concern in an area. Because pests travel, but they don't always have the, the, the possibility to cause an introduction, which means they enter in a, in a region and they can establish and they can spread and have an impact in a certain region. And that's where the flow of the information from the assessor side is, is, is very, very important. Uh, then uh, we, we do, in, in, in case of, of, of uh, problems, because there is an, a scanning, huh? there is a scanning of the literature, the scanning of the literature, we, we look at our borders and we look at our territory, this is all source of information. Everybody plays a role on giving, the, uh, giving that information, as I said before. Then on the, on the basis of that, the decision starts, the, the discussion starts of taking action. Member states can take actions as soon as they find a pest in their territory which they know the pose a problem. Before this becomes an EU regulated, there is this possibility. And this, this takes place when we intercept pests in, at, at consignments and we do take measures when something is found in our territory to, to, to eradicate it. And uh, Nico, uh, before you were telling me something very interesting, um, I actually have Swiss nationality, but you can hear I'm British, and the British love dogs, and you were talking about intercepting on borders, you're thinking, where am I going with this? Uh, but you were mentioning sniffer dogs. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is some, uh, some experience with sniffer dogs for find detecting pests, and this, uh, of course, is one of the areas where I see research and testing it out in the field. Uh, could be further developed. And of course, it certainly doesn't work for all pests. But we have seen this morning that remote sensing would be able to detect Xylella before we can see it visually. Uh, so I think these elements are all things where we have to look into. And we try also as EPO to bring that together and uh, to bring also, say, the researchers, like remote sensing. That's an area where there is a lot of knowledge, but we don't know how we can use it, and the uh, scientists working with remote sensors, sensing don't know what we need. So in that sense, we have to work together and communicate and see, uh, express our needs and exchange that. And it's with sniffer dogs, that's with uh, remote sensing, but there are a lot of other techniques. Uh, molecular biology can play an important role. So collaboration and taking all your role and communicating on what your needs are and what the possibilities are. I think that's important. So you're obviously pests, but I think we heard from Helen that there's not much known about microbes and diseases and pathogens. Yeah, but, but, but maybe good to make it clear. I use the word pests in the IPPC sense. It's pests and diseases. Okay. So it covers everything. 
So, uh, of course, also uh, the same applies to uh, viruses, uh, bacteria, xylalizer bacteria, uh, the, the, and um, phytoplasmas, uh, all what we have. Uh, if I've understood Helen's premise uh, correctly, and please uh, correct me, it was that we were not making so much progress on uh, diseases. Is that right? We heard, I think it was Anna, I'm going to go back to Helen now. Anna, I loved it when she, well, I didn't love it because it's serious, but about cereal rust never sleeps, I think was the message. Um, Helen, if there's a, a, a microphone for Helen, and I've misquoted you, uh, please... Uh, Make your point. Yes, I can make my point loudly, perhaps. But it was more about the garden. I don't Yes, indeed. Our remote audience would like to hear you too. Thank you very much for the opportunity to clarify. So, I, with respect to wildlife diseases, when we're thinking around horizon scanning and making predictions about biological invasions, and particularly in the context of biodiversity and ecosystem impacts, we're really lagging behind with the um, understanding of pathogens and wildlife diseases. But for sure, we have a huge amount to learn on the biodiversity and ecosystem side from the plant health side, from the animal health, from human health. And I think this is where it's really important to be thinking across the one health. So, you know, the, the fantastic progress that's been made within plant health and the way in which, as you describe, both the pests being both the pathogens and, for example, the insects and other things. But when we think about biodiversity and ecosystem impacts, um, we are really far behind on thinking of wildlife diseases, even though we know about things like chytrid fungus um, causing extinctions of amphibians. So that was my that context. Super. Great to get clarifications and comments from the audience. Yeah. Thank you. And Nico. Yeah, I would like to react on this because uh, we try to preserve biodiversity. One element of biodiversity is the biodiversity in the pests themselves. And uh, there is a lot of uh, biodiversity. We've seen that with the rusts, the changes, the isolates. We, interestingly, in APA, we had a discussion yesterday on we have an alert list alerting for possible new uh, diseases. And we alerted, we put on the alert list a, spe a trichoderma species. And a trichoderma species are also often used in biological control. So we're having a discussion is this the same species? And maybe even the same isolate that's used for biological control, now acting as a pest? Or is that the biodiversity within that fungus species that uh, uh, gives this variance? Maybe it's another isolate, maybe it's genetically different, uh, but we should realize that we, by, by preserving biodiversity, we're also combating the biodiversity in the pest that's uh, actually continuously adapt to new situations. If you have a resistant variety, you're not a uh, 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 isolate of the fungus or virus may come up. So uh, it, it looks like a, a, a battle, but that's been, if you look in history, has always been the battle of mankind against <laughs> the changes in nature. So biodiversity has also the other side that we uh, uh, we have continuously to do with other isolates, other species. There are thousands and thousands of species that could potentially be pests. That's the biodiversity. <laughs> it's interesting, that's the other side of the coin. Uh, I'd like to close the poll and we'll bring back uh, Elisabeth. She will talk to us about biological controls in a moment, but let's go to Max for his yes, thoughts. Very fast as well, I mean, uh, without going into nitty gritty, I mean, on the field level, on the farm level, we are the one that actually take care of the full cocktail. It doesn't matter what it is. It's everything might be there and all of this. So, I mean, that's why it's very simple. Please get out from the silos. We have to look at it as a whole thing when you go into these kind of things. I mean, pests, diseases, whatever. So I think that that's the main thing that we have to learn. I mean, they move fast, they are there. They are very fast moving to the next one. Please get out from the silos. It goes the same for the farmers. As well, we also have to get involved, let the information flow also into the research, to the academia, into the trade, what we have seen, what's going on, etc. So I think that, that we can do it together, and that's why we cannot be in the silos. And that's why I think that this One Health is an extremely good 
name and it's extremely good way of going forward and at least in this Congress, once we see that EFSA, but all the other sister organizations are involved. And as, as you say, it's all working together, and we've heard a lot about citizen science. Elisabetti, let me bring you in, because I know that you're a strong advocate of that. Can you explain what you do in Portugal? <laughs> yes, I mean, uh, I, I think all that has been discussed on, until now and all the institutional monitoring and surveillance schemes and all the technologies are really important, but we really need to involve the public. And I, I think uh, Ellen in the, the morning showed that very clearly for Asia Nornet, that the public help to prevent the establishment of these invasive species, because citizens are everywhere. And if they are uh, alert and aware of the species, they can help preventing them and hardly detecting them and even controlling these invasive species and also plant pests and pathogens. But when they are not aware, they are on the other side of the coin and they can introduce species and spread species. So I think raising awareness is essential and engaging the public to help us uh, detecting and reporting the species is very, very important. And of course, this public can be the general public, but it can be the farmers or the foresters or other stakeholders that are engaged in different activities. And Elisabetti, and how do you do that in Portugal? What system do you have? We have a, a, a platform, a citizen science platform, where we report invasive plants. So we just ask the public to, uh, when they see a plant, an invasive species, to report it with an app or with the website. And uh, in that way, we can know where the species are. This is used for knowing the distribution and it's very useful for science for us to um, make models and understand the distribution and the way species uh, can uh, uh, distribute in the country, but it's also used for management when we detect new species and species that are starting to establish and can be uh, notified to the authorities in a way that they can try to eradicate them and uh, be active in the field. So, and there are plenty of uh, platforms like these around Europe. There are some at European level, the, the one from um, GRC, EASIM, that it's for the implementation of the uh, invasive alien species regulation. But in many, many countries, there are um, platforms and hubs like these that report the species and help detecting the species as soon as possible. I mean, it sounds a wonderful idea, citizen science, very democratic, but are there any risks with the accuracy of the data and that you might be led off on red herrings in false directions as a result of inaccurate data? Yes, of course, we need to be careful. I mean, in our platform, we ask people to uh, submit pictures and uh, in a way that we can have some uh, uh, idea of what people are reporting. And when we have um, doubts about the identification, we write to, to the citizens asking more details or more pictures in a way that we can understand which species they are reporting. Nico, what role for citizen science in your organization? No, not directly in our organization in the sense that we support uh, we an intergovernmental organization supporting governments. But uh, we have, for instance, developed uh, standards on how governments could raise the awareness of people. And I think that's a, an important element of citizen science. If you have them look at invasive alien plants, they're also becoming more and more aware of the risk of it. And you mentioned that already, but uh, uh, having them to look uh, for a certain species which they saw maybe in their environment, but didn't realize that it was an, an invasive species. So it, it makes them more aware of it. And also, m if, uh, if you um, supplement that with uh, awareness campaigns, they may also become aware uh, what they could do themselves to 
prevent not to bring them in, not to bring seats back from holiday, wherever you go, because that's also an important element. Mm. And Mylona, is this something that is on the list of uh, priorities of the Commission, that citizen science and education and awareness is, is very important? And do you actually take this data, I don't know whether your department does, and actually use it? Uh, our department directly works with pest risk assessments, and I think that this information, it fits in on the pest risk assessment as such. Uh, but uh, as I said, awareness raising is in, in the basis, the philosophy and the basis of our, of our legislative framework. Uh, um, if you don't know, if you're traveling sometimes outside the EU and come in, there is a poster. In, uh, when you enter, that says, don't bring this or bring with phytosanitary certificates. There are some, some species, some fruits, that, five fruits that, for which this is not required. Uh, there is a video available that's been produced uh, to inform the public of the risks of bringing material from uh, different areas as such. In the member states, there are several awareness campaigns, uh, awareness raising campaigns for specific pests that they are of, of concern as such for the, uh, for the public in, the, in, in that particular area or the particular country as such. Uh, the um, uh, operators, of course, uh, they are uh, aware and they, they get the information as such, but for, it is important for the hobbies when they walk around in the forest they can spot pests that have were not there before, and they can inform uh, in, through a platform. Of course, the uh, data, as, as the previous speaker said, the data need to be checked. Is this of concern? Uh, if, if a new species is arriving, then there comes the discussion, what is the invasiveness of this species? Is it of a plant health concern under the current time? Uh, is, it, is it something that would cause an introduction? And et cetera, et cetera. So, but it is a starting point and a very important starting point, I think. So if we uh, looked at the poll, I think uh, the answer that got the most uh, votes was supporting research initiatives on detection and control methods against plant health. So let's have a bit of a discussion about uh, pest uh, uh, control. Max, these new pests coming in, how do you manage them? Can you use existing pesticides? Yes, that's a very good question. Sometimes yes, and sometimes no. That depends a little bit what we are talking about. If it is a new type of a disease or something, it could be that we might not have exactly that uh, product in the toolbox, or maybe it is in the toolbox, but it has not yet been authorized to be used on this and this different type of a crop. It needs to be monitored to check and maybe getting then minor use or authorization to use it. So it might be a little bit tricky. And usually, I mean, in many member states it goes quite fast, but still some of these diseases, again, are even faster. So that's one thing. But usually we have, until now, at least inside the European Union, a fairly good toolbox of uh, plant protection products available, if you look at the whole EU. Even if we see that in the last years and in the upcoming years, we will see that there will be less and less ac active substances in place. So I, I think that we have a fairly good one as long as we know and have the knowledge again how to take care of this, if it is a disease or if it is a pest by itself and how and at what point you should actually then do the plant protection for it. So I mean, we need also the knowledge. We need it also to move in to the farming sector as fast as possible so that we would be able to take the right decision and right action. Under the farm to fork strategy, you're being asked to reduce the use of uh, pesticides and to use less hazardous pesticides. Are those less hazardous pesticides on, on the market? Are they available? Unfortunately, not enough. They are coming, they are coming very slowly in. I would say that most of the farmers, I mean, we switch as fast as possible into more or less, let's say like this, more less hazardous pesticides as we can get our hands on them. We also need to maintain the amount of different active substances and for sure when the biological ones come in, they will be also taken in to our rotation, into our plant protection programs, etc. But today there is maybe, there is, at least in my opinion, when I look at it from my point of view, from the northern parts, there are not enough of these products on the market. At least when I look more into, for instance, on herbicides, 
that's really, I mean, you can count them more or less on one hand's fingers, how many there are available for the crops in my region. And the same goes for a lot of other EU countries as well. So we need to speed up this thing if we need and if we want to have a faster impact as Farm to Fork is actually implying to do. For sure, we have the IPM that we have been using actually as not a secret always. It was just given a name, IPM, but the farmers always go out and check and see what needs to be done and how and at what time, etc. So we are using it already, but that does not mean that you can just cut down too much because then you have very difficult to actually follow the IPM because if you have there a pest with six legs and you only have the, how would I say, the medicine against two-legged ones, that's the only <laughs> one you can use. And it might not take care of that with six legs. So we need a broad amount. And here I think that the biological ones would be good, but we need also the knowledge as farmers. How do they work? How do they fit into our rotation? How do they actually stay there? Will we have to change from a four or five-year rotation into an eight-year rotation, for instance, because they do have a different type of effect, not only on the plants itself, but also on the soil, soil microbials, etc. So we need the time also to adapt into use this, and sometimes that is very much forgotten. Nico, your thoughts on biopesticides? Uh, I think uh, having read the ambition of the Green Deal, there is a lot to be done. And I think that should be, and it was mentioned also by my colleague here, uh, it should be a concerted effort. You can't ask the farmers just to do this. You also need to offer them the solutions. So it's also what activities do we develop on control measures, on uh, biological control. Uh, so uh, in, in biopesticides, there is a difference between, uh, say, insects as uh, biological control and biopesticides because they also in the EU they are under a different regulation. Uh, if there is any for the insects, there is not, uh, 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 that's more left to the countries. And the Commission is now doing a, a survey how that's done in the countries. Uh, EPO has done quite some activities and is doing activities on biological control agents. The, ar the arthropod, the, the insect uh, used for that. Uh, but also we should look at uh, what can scientists do uh, and not only in one country, in one system, but also over all the countries, we should have uh, collaboration in the research. And that's one of the tools that EPO is offering also. We have uh, what's called Eufresco, which is a, a project, uh, or it's not a project, it's a, a way of collaboration to, um, to work together on the problems. Uh, we have uh, many pest problems, uh, but in the past uh, this was a bit scattered. Uh, and if countries have the same problems, why not work together? Uh, and that's what Eufresco as a network for research uh, collaboration is. So uh, there is a big challenge. And I think it's r good to have this ambition, but we also have to solve that together. And uh, we can't, and, and if, we, if I say together, it is research, uh, risk assessors, uh, policy makers, farmers, but also the citizens. Because they, I think they also play an important role in uh, what their role is in what they expect the farmer to produce and what they would like to pay for that. Let me bring in Elisabetti, because you are working on uh, biological agents uh, to control invasive plants. And I, I think you said that uh, the, the, there's not really uh, much being, so much being done on using biological uh, control. It's, it's come quite slowly in, in Europe. Elisabetti, your, your thoughts on using this to counter the invasion of these plants? Yes, I, I think it can be part of the solution, but as you said, the classical biological control, so I'm speaking of using natural enemies, specific natural enemies selected from the native range of the invasive plant and that are introduced, uh, released in the areas where they are invasive. And these for plants is not very much used in Europe. The first biocontrol agent against an invasive plant in Europe was released in 2010 in the UK against Japanese knotweed. And uh, in the, the mainland Europe, 
The first one was in 2015 against an invasive acacia here in Portugal. Uh, but there are many potential um, target invasive plants that could be um, uh, managed with biocontrol because in other parts of the world, many uh, biocontrol agents have been selected for these species. So I think it's not yet very much used in Europe and uh, there are only a few <laughs> until now, although for pest plants, biocontrol is much more used but I think it can be uh, a great help and part of the solution to, uh, to deal with these invasive plants that are widespread along Europe, definitely. You were nodding there, Max. Yes, absolutely. I think that, uh, I mean, these are things that we need, at least when we are pushed, at least today, it feels like we are pushed by the legislation. It is also legislation that we know that has been on its way to come and we have been reducing in most of the member states already use of plant protection products more and more from year to year. And we have put maybe more effort than in when we come to the field crops into plant breeding side. So I think that there we have a new solution is also that they have to work hand in hand, the biological side, but also the plant breeding where you will have resilient resistance from the plants itself and see what they can do. And I think that this is a path that we should really look into even more closely and make sure that we will really exploit and explore the possibilities from that way. And I think that even through that, there could be that we might not need as fast of these biological ones as it looks like it takes some time before they get the permission to be used here. Maybe the plant breeding can fill that gap for a while at least. And then they have to work hand in hand. I was going to ask you about that because, of course, I think we, we heard from India that uh, plant uh, breeding these uh, varieties of this uh, fall army worm, and you're very advanced. And I'm just wondering because I remember that it, it shocked a lot of people when the uh, ECJ ruling came against using some of these technologies like CRISPR uh, CASP. And I know the Commission is reviewing uh, this at, at, the, at the moment. But is your concern that Europe is lagging behind on? innovation of new plant breeding technologies? In a way, yes. I think that maybe not lagging behind, but I think that the debate and the discussion about this is, uh, how would I say, is not coming high enough inside the society either. We somehow don't want to talk about it. We just want to push it to the side. Whereas instead of that, we should actually bring it really high up into the agenda. Start discussing about it try to involve the science there as well and try to see what can we achieve with it. But also at the same time look a little bit in, okay, what kind of a contra do we have there as well? I mean, we have to be open and bring in the real information into the discussion. Because today I think that after a ruling, uh, I don't know if you can say misinformation, but let's say information coming just from one source has maybe been the leading one. And that for sure is not easy then for legislators or for the politicians to then even start the debate to change rulings, change the law, etc. So I think that we need this kind of a debate yesterday. And that's the thing. That's why we are lagging behind. When it then becomes a possibility to use it, then let's see. But then at least we have, can take the decision with all the information available from the European perspective. Look at it from our perspective. What can be done here? Nico, any thoughts on plant breeding new technologies? Is this going to help us out of uh, this invasion of uh, pests that we're, that we're seeing due to climate change and also increasing trade? Uh, a good element, uh, but what I think, there is not one solution. And I think we shouldn't bet on one horse. We need them all. And I think there are so many different problems we have to face in plant health that breeding is an important element of it. And I've uh, seen that with the fall armyworm in maize. But then let's be careful, like we have seen other examples where, and I'm calling that a fissarium in banana, where we rely on one variety almost worldwide for the banana production. Uh, and that's attacked, then you lose it. So let's not make that kind of mistake in plant breeding that we find a single solution. But I understood from the presentation that there were a number of hybrid varieties developed. So I think that's certainly one of the solution, but not the only one. Uh, we, don't, we don't solve all our problems just with breeding. 
I don't believe that. <laughs> Let's take some audience questions, and there's one that perhaps I'll direct at Max. Why supporting organic agriculture or agroecology is rated as one measure and not IPM? This was, of course, also in the poll. Um, IPM is not restricted in the tools, whereas the first is. Shouldn't we embrace some innovative, safe, and less impactful tools like GMOs or yeah, gene edit? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question, but I think IPM goes also for organic agriculture and agroecology and all of these. It goes to all of those. So, I mean, they are not, they are part of it as well. And all of these, I mean, organic agriculture, agroecology and the conventional agriculture, we all have to be able to coexist. And I think with that together then by using the same type of tools, meaning IPM, that we are controlling whatever is happening on our fields, depending on how you grow, or depend less to it, regard less to it, we will be able better to actually work with this. So they go hand in hand inside this. And then I think that the last one there, when you were talking about GMO, I think we should maybe more talk about new breeding techniques that should be brought in there. I think we just had a good debate about it. They do have possibilities, I'm sure, but they are not the only ones. We will need plant protection products. We will need also mechanical de-weeding, for instance, when it comes in. We need all different ways of doing it. But we also need the flexibility on the farm level to do this job. I mean, if there is coming in rulings that you have to plant three crops or five crops, have a rotation, I have very hard as a professional farmer to do my best job on the fields. Because it could be that in my region there are actually just three crops that will be I will be able to grow because of the disease pressure or pest pressure and I know that I have to do five. What the hell do I do to comply with the law? So the thing is that we need the flexibility. We are growing under the big roof. And the big roof, everybody knows it can rain any minute, blow, wind. It's changing very rapidly. We have to be able to do the best on field level to be able to anticipate this and bring in the crops that fits at that stage into my rotation. So I see, think here, and this is my personal opinion, I think here we have gone a little bit too far when you start to put in that you have to do maximum so many percentage of this crop and then you have to have a second crop and a third crop. Farmers follow crop rotation. That is our tool, how to maintain and make our soils in good shape and all of this. We also follow the markets. And the market is becoming more and more important because from there our income is really coming. We also have to follow the market. So you cannot tie our hands. And I think that if we can have more leeway, I have a small feeling that we will be able better to take care of the plant health and the soil health in the near future. T two questions from our audience that I want to address uh, before I hand over. Let's uh, take the one, Elisabetti. Do you think that involving more citizens in the plant health issues of forest, parks and green areas could contribute to a higher appreciation of the value and acceptance of plant protection products? Yes, definitely. <laughs> I think if we engage the people and raise awareness of the people to be in contact with nature and with the environment in general, they will be more um, engaged and more emotionally connected with plants and everything. And, the, and that can make a, a, a big difference for everything. And uh, as someone said, when we are involving the citizens in these citizen science projects, we are uh, also raising awareness and making them aware and uh, understand the impacts of these species and the, the problems that they represent. So engaging and involving the, the people, I think it has all kinds of benefits. And, uh, and also for the, the species that we don't cultivate, but for the wild species that are around the cultivated areas that are also very important to protect the, the, the crops because they support all the pollinators and all the species that depend on these species. And if we, instead of the wild plants, we have invasive plants that are 
replacing these, of course, we are also affecting and harming the, the crops. So I think everyone can help and engaging people uh, in uh, all these uh, levels of management of either invasive plants or the, the best uh, plants is really, really important and uh, it can be very useful for the management of all these issues. Elizabeth, another question for you, and then uh, I think a final question, most probably for Mylona. Uh, Elizabeth, native plants and animals can also become invasive in unbalanced environments. So are there safeguards for that if used as biological controls? Uh, we are speaking of different things. We, in each country, we have the native species that when they have disturbed the environment and very anthropogenic um, environments, sometimes they bad behave, and uh, but we call them weeds. So they are where we are not expecting them to be and where they can in some way harm our objectives, but they are not invasive in the sense that they are not from other territories and were not introduced, but they can be out of equilibrium, so to say, and in that sense, they can uh, harm, for instance, crops. And we have many weeds that are native and that are not welcome and because they are uh, in some way harming the productivity of the crops that we use. Uh, and that can also happen with animals. And in that, for that species, we can use biocontrol. But it's not the biocontrol that I was speaking before because it's not classical biocontrol in the sense that you are going to the native range of the species uh, to, to get a, a specific organisms to control it. But uh, you can use uh, natural enemies as biocontrol agents from the native region, but you need to be much more careful because they have to be specific. You cannot just find some um, insect that eats the plant and uh, it can eat everything else <laughs> that is around. Understood. That uh, it's so not risk free. It. <laughs> yeah, it's not risk free. You have to test it and to select it. And you can only use and augment or uh, promote the organisms that are targeting the species that you want to control, not all the other species. Understood. So, so I'm just going to, because I realise that time is up and we've got one more question. Mylona, I don't know whether you can answer it, but there's a question which is about sniffer dogs, so therefore I uh, have to ask it. For the surveillance for regulated pests in EU, is there a future funding programme by the European Commission to develop and implement new survey technologies such as remote sensing and sniffer dogs in the member states? Okay, I don't know how the, if the future funding program for research will be like. Uh, we will have to wait for its publication, but I can assure you that there's been past uh, funding, uh, research funding on, on these issues for, for several years in every, from back to FP7, as far as I remember, there is, there is uh, um, funding for research for survey technologies within these projects uh, that have been funded in the period, remote sensing and sniffer dogs have been part of that. Uh, and um, what I would like to stress is that uh, what we said from the beginning, that all factors need to talk to each other. So from the moment that something is very promising at the level of, of research, then the next step is that it goes to implementation. And how this implementation can be done, then we need to have in these projects also the other factors, the, the other actors, sorry. As such, so for a, for a tool to pass from the research to the implementation, it has to be easy, it has to be eff efficac effic the efficacy should be high, and it should be in a price that can be paid as such. So that, the, all that needs to happen. And then um, uh, sniffer dogs are used, and remote sensing as well. So that is proven as uh, some of the tools that we have. So I would very much like to thank our audience, remote and here, also for your great uh, questions. Uh, thank you very much, Elisabeth, Nico, Mylona, Max, for the panel discussion. And it just leaves me to hand over to Claude Braga for the final remarks. Okay, so it's time now, now to 
conclude this session on protecting plants in the era of global change. And so we have had a three-step session. Uh, at first, we started with Ellen Roy in a very nice uh, explanation on the emerging trends of uh, introductions of alien species into the EU territory, for example. And how also we could even predict and, and try to, to anticipate this by horizon scanning. And then, okay, I should go to the stage. So this way you, you see me better probably. So, really nice introduction, emerging trends, and, and how to anticipate this by, by, by prediction, horizon scanning. Then two, two nice examples. I, I would say only two examples, because of course we have had a very nice explanations about serial rust by Anna Berlino and uh, by Prasanna uh, Botupali on the Valarme worm. So, a fungi, an insect, but there are many other pests that we have to deal with, and that's very important also. And Prasanna explained also how to tackle uh, this major problem for Africa, mentioning breeding, but different kinds of actions that could be taken. So, setting the scene. And then the solutions, with a very nice uh, presentation by Peter Beck, on remote sensing and how it could contribute to surveillance and, and looking at uh, the state of our forest, for example. And I would like to, to keep from this talk also the, the importance of, of ground data. So we can, of course, use remote sensing, but we, we, knew we, we really need, need to have also very good data from the grounds and, and keep working all together on this. And then Sarah Brunel uh, from IPPC, and I keep in mind for, from your talk really the importance of placing the people in the middle of uh, the action, and that's very important. Uh, raising capacity, uh, training the people, uh, that's also very, very important in this field. And of course, raising awareness, uh, and you mentioned uh, this, this uh, International Year for Plant Health, the Day for Plant Health, this is very important, communication with the public, and raising uh, awareness on plant health, it's a major issue. And of course, I will also underline Vittoria Valenzi. It's so nice to have this youth declaration on plant health. It's very important also. And again, this is really awareness. And finally, I stress the, uh, the presentation by Lorenzo Marini on the OP project, an initiative of EFSA, uh, to identify hotspots for introductions, uh, for establishment of pests into the EU. And, and of course, uh, by looking both at global trade and climate change. And I would like to stress, because we have had this discussion, what is the most important? Is it climate change or is it global trade? Of course, there is also a question of time frame. Uh, uh, because nowadays, global trade is, is there. Climate change is there also, we feel it, as we mentioned, Peter mentioned this is in this talk. But there is also a question of, of time frame. If we, we are looking at crops, which are let's say, grown just on a year basis, or if we look at trees that are grown for, let's say, 40, 50 years, this is different, but we have to take all these points into, into consideration. This was the second step, and then we have had a very, very nice panel discussion, so thank you, all of you, uh, and I, I want to, to quote you all, Nico Orn from EPO, Milona Padagiotis, I'm sorry, I'm always misspelling your names, from the EU DG Sente, Max Schulman from Copa Cojeca, uh, uh, sorry, and Elisabeth Marchante from Coimbra. So very nice discussion. And I will just take, take a, a few words, uh, but maybe what struck me is, is the demand for speed and, and rapid action. So this is uh, really important, of course. And if you want to tackle uh, plant pests like quarantine ones, it's very important to be very fast. But to be Fast, probably, we, we must be pre prepared. And so preparedness is so important. Anticipation. Of course, we can build projects on horizon scanning, like the OPI project, to try to identify hotspots, be prepared. That's a, a, a first thing. Raising awareness is the second point I would like to keep in mind. Um, really uh, draw the attention on plant health. Maybe plant health has been misregarded in the past. and. This was mentioned several times. We are in the One Earth uh, conference. It's so nice to bring plant earth also with other issues, of course, animal earth, human earth. This is a whole, and we are part of it. And speaking about biodiversity, 
along with plant health, it's so important also. It's, it's a major issue upcoming for the, for the next years. I keep also in mind capacity building. If we want to be prepared, we have really to have the right people at the right place. We need to build expertise to be ready to act rapidly, and this is also an important point. And I will just finish with this. I would like to thank all those who contributed. Of course, those who were on the scene, the speakers, the one who contributed to the panel discussion. But I would like also to thank all those who are behind the scene. I look at you. I won't be able to quote all your names. We, you have moderators there, there uh, Chiro, all the organizers, the ones that are technically helping us to organize this type of sessions, hybrid sessions. So thank you also all you who participated actively by providing questions, answers. And, and keep in touch, I think networking, and this is maybe the main message we have uh, from today's session, we should really network, not stay in our silos, but really interact in between organization, in between people, bring all together all these ideas, and thank you so much for this very interesting morning session. <laughs>